Fox Sports. We are Fox Sports. We are Minnesota. Last night, Max Kepler's three RBIs kept the Twins on pace with Cleveland, who beat the Rangers last night. They came back to beat Texas 5-1 to one today. So in the American League Central, right now, it's Cleveland by one over the Minnesota Twins. The clock is still ticking for fans to help get Miguel Sano to the All-Star Game as the starting third baseman for the American League, but the clock is ticking down fast. Kepler, Sano, and the rest of the Twins will look to gain the split of this four-game series as we get ready for the final game here in Boston tonight at historic Fenway Park. And Twins Baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by State Farm. Welcome inside Fenway Park. The Twins with a nice bounce back effort last night and like they've been doing all season long. They did it with pitching and more specifically great team defense which leads us to our State Farm combination. It revolves around that awesome team defense. 18 defensive runs saved second most in the American League. Look at the big league average of just 3.75. When I talked to pitcher Tyler Duffy, he said it is so much easier to put the ball over the plate and pitch effectively when you know you've got that great defense out there behind you. Buxton and Maurer have led the way. Buxton, 16 defensive runs saved. First among outfielders, Joe Maurer, zero errors in 500 opportunities at first base, which is second among all first basemen in the league. Brian Dozier said this started way back in spring training. We put an emphasis on fundamental baseball and playing the game the right way. Last year, they were minus 49. What a dramatic improvement for this Minnesota Twins team starting at spring training and now nearly to the All-Star break, playing great team defense for our State Farm combination. They'll need to be really good tonight because not a lot of room for error with the price reduction in play. David Price has been so tough on Minnesota, but when we come back, Dick Kramer and Jack Morris show you how the Twins can flip the script and beat David Price tonight. Twins baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by Toyota. Tested, trusted Toyota. Toyota, let's go places. By CenturyLink, connecting you to the power of the digital world. And by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, for the everyday competitor in all of us.
got a chance to really walk around Boston a little bit uh, this last year and uh, really cool. A lot of cool buildings, great breakfast places uh, that are kind of tucked into residential areas. So uh, it's a really cool place to go. The Twins hope they can count on Kyle Gibson for the rest of this season. He's had his season disrupted with a stint in the minor leagues. And for David Price, the Red Sox counting on him too, but his season started late because of an injury, and they will face off against one another in the final game of the season series here at Fenway Park. And we welcome you to Boston for the final time this year. Dick Bramer and Jack Morris as the Twins hope to get a split of this four-game series. For whatever reason, Kyle Gibson should feel comfortable here tonight because he's come up with two of his better starts here at Fenway Park. He has. I can't explain exactly why that is, but Kyle Gibson has pitched well in Fenway. You see the numbers in this ballpark, 15 in innings pitched, a really, really good ERA. So maybe Kyle can continue with that, uh, and those kind of numbers here at Fenway tonight. The Twins would love to see him do that because that would mean a split of this series as they head into Kansas City tomorrow. Twins will face their third left-handed starting pitcher in this four-game series and a guy they know very, very well. Well, this guy's a veteran, and he's won a lot of ball games. Uh, he's a guy that knows how to compete. He's had a few issues this year, like you mentioned, Dick. A fingernail, uh, a little bit of a blister, and then some issues with the press. Never a good idea. I could, you could ask me about that. I could have told him that that wasn't a good idea. But David Price is a competitor, and he's going to go out. He's had good numbers against the Twins. Twins have a chance to clinch a winning June, their third straight winning month. It'll be the final game of the season series between the Twins and the Boston Red Sox. Fenway, um, probably my favorite place to play. And one of my favorite uh, ballparks to play in and one of my favorite cities to go to. The history of the of all the players that have played there and uh, the Green Monster. The left field wall, which I'm not the guy really to go to right field that much, so I like hitting it to left field and it's really short. Well, the Twins hope to get a split of this four game series. And they've played pretty well here over the years. They've had a lot of four game series here at Fenway Park. Won the ball game last night after losing the first two. And then the Twins after the game will go to Kansas City. And they've got four games there in three days. So good road trip for the Twins. Of course a three game sweep in Cleveland. Winning last night. And the Menards batting order for the Twins has Brian Dozier leading off hoping to reach the left field fence. Then uh, Robbie Grossman, Joe Maurer, Miguel Sano, 
Eduardo Escobar, Jorge Polanco, Max Kepler, Chris Jimenez, and Byron Buxton. David Price will oppose the Twins here tonight. Uh, he's two and two with a 4.76 ERA this year, but has won each of his last five decisions against the Twins, posting a 1.84 ERA. He knows how to pitch. He's had great success against the Twins, so the Twins are going to have to come out swinging the bats. Well, here's Dozier facing Price, and we're underway. Ball one. Dozier, Grossman, and Maurer in the first. There's no stranger to Price. They had trouble with him when he was with Tampa Bay, with Detroit, with Toronto, and now with the Red Sox. And a drive to the gap in left center field. And that ball will one hop the wall, and Dozier goes to second with a leadoff double. David Price throws a lot of fastballs. He's always been known as a guy that'll challenge hitters. And occasionally leaves him out over the plate. That one was such a case. And Ryan Dozier jumping all over it. Outer third of the plate, but a fastball belt high. And he finds the gap in left field. Twins are uh, already uh, have a runner in scoring position. And now with that double, Dozier's now tied with Joe Maurer for the team lead with 17. Here's Robbie Grossman. Takes a strike. And Robbie is turning around, batting right hand tonight. Had a tough time last night with Rick Porcello. First three at bats struck out, but tonight different story. Just gets a right hander, and you heard him in the pregame there. He loves to play in this ballpark. Take it low, one and one. The fingernail issue for Price has been recent. Before that, it was a blister problem, and way before that, back in spring training, it was some elbow discomfort. So he has not been healthy, and durability has been one of his strengths over the years. Crack foul. And it is one and two. One thing that we're going to watch here early in the game is his velocity. Fastball, 94 miles an hour. And here's a guy that can get it up or used to get it up I should say 96 97 at times he's got a good breaking ball but he doesn't use it as much as a lot of people think he should and uh, really kind of has put the change up on the shelf as a plate and become more of a two pitch pitcher one and two to Grossman he can inside two and two yeah he just they say he has not developed a feel for the changeup which has been an important pitch for him. Yeah when things were really going good for David uh, and we thought we're talking about a guy that won the Cy Young Award from the American League in 2012 five time all star uh, that was part of his pitch repertoire his arsenal two and two and a drive to right center field Bradley Backpedaling, making the catch deep enough to advance Dozier. And he will round third and hold up there. So a productive out for Grossman. And you don't figure to get too many opportunities like this against Price. The Twins will try to cash in here with Maurer coming to the play. Northland Ford defense for the Red Sox. Andrew Benintendi is in left. Jackie Bradley Jr. is in center. And Wookie Betts in right. Changes in the infield. Devin Marrero at third. Xander Bogarts at short. But Su Wei Lin in for Dustin Pedroia is having some knee issues. Mitch Moreland at first. Christian Vasquez behind the plate. Here's Maurer. And the infield playing back. They'll concede the run unless it's hit back to the mound or to the third baseman, Marrero. Maurer up the middle. Dozier will score. A well hit ball on a two hopper. Bowers retired, but he's driven in his 30th run of the year. Well, all that is because of Robbie Grossman being able to hit the ball deep enough in center field and the first out of this half inning, and that got Brian Dozier over to third base. And then Joe hits this ball sharply, picks up an RBI, gets past Price, and like you mentioned, Dick, they're not going to challenge the runner at home, go to first base, and uh, Twins on the board. 
Base is empty for Miguel Sano, the designated hitter. Word came out today that Miguel has agreed to participate in the home run derby. And he will be going to the All-Star game. It's just a question of whether he will be voted in by the fans. And right now his lead over Jose Ramirez with just hours left is wafer thin. By All-Star voting standards Ooh. like 30,000 votes. And a couple of nights ago it was 200,000 votes. So we encourage you to go ahead and if you haven't already max out on your votes for Miguel Sano. We got to keep this in mind the Cleveland game is over with so they're home voting right now for their <laughs> that's game. right. So we're going to have to help them out. Oh and two to Sano. A little before midnight Eastern time is when the voting will cease. We can still vote after that it's just they won't count. <laughs> Practice for next year. Oh and two to Sano got the twins started with an RBI double in the first inning last night. Check your swing. One and two. There's one of the first changeups from David Price. But like we talked about, had trouble commanding it. It's down in the zone. And Snow just spit on it. That was one of the impressive things about Mejia last night. He seemed to have really good command of his off speed stuff. One and two. And now two and two. David is in that point in his career where I think he's going to have to make adjustments in somewhat way in some way reinvent himself. He has thrown a lot of innings uh, over the last few years you know postseason innings also which really can tax a guy and he wants it. He's the guy that loves that opportunity. Old foul over by the Twins dugout. But I think most people have recognized that he's lost some velocity. Sano will be participating. We don't really know who his competition will be yet in the home run hitting competition, but he's got 18 with uh, less than have half we, the season played. Have we determined who his pitcher will be? We're talking with Fred Guerrero, the scout who's here, who signed Miguel Sano, and talking about uh, some possibilities for that. One of them is Fred Guerrero's brother, who now is a, a coach with the Biloxi Shuckers. The Southern League. I'm telling you right now, it's just as important to have the guy tee him up. The yeah, pitcher on the mound right. is very, very important to, in that home run derby. And endurance, the other one. There's a few folks think that Miguel might run out of gas. Take a lot of swings. Full count with two down and Escobar on deck. And fly to right. Chased by Betts. And Sano retired. The Twins cash in on Dozier's leadoff double. A couple of at bats later, the Twins have a 1 0 lead for Kyle Gibson.
but in 15 innings pitched in this ballpark, Kyle Gibson's only given up one run. And the Menard batting order that he'll face in the series finale. Mookie Betts leading off, Andrew Benintendi. Xander Bogarts, Mitch Moreland, Hanley Ramirez back in the lineup, Jackie Bradley Jr., Christian Vasquez, Tewe. Start again. Lynn. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm sorry. Lynn hitting eighth, and then Devin Marrero. And Kyle Gibson getting the start tonight against Boston. Like Dick just mentioned, he's had really good numbers here at Fenway. I hope that can continue here tonight. Su Wei Lin. I had probably the excuse I had for stumbling on the man's name, and I apologize. Want to know? Chili Davis said they call him Two Way, Two Lane, Two Way Lane. But his name is Su Wei Lin. One and one to Mookie Betts, and now two and one. Betts, Benintendi, and Bogarts. We talked about it last night. Adalberto Mejia came out with a two run lead. A couple runs to work with. Kyle's got a run to work with here. And he needs to go after guys early in this ball game. That's the one thing that. I think has been a nemesis for Kyle is the pitch count. And one way to. Maybe work on that is to attack the zone early. You've got runs to work with. Taking low three and two. And you've got to avoid those counts. Three two three two those. Will wear on everybody and Kyle if he wants to get deep in a game and the bullpen certainly could use him doing that tonight. Rounder right side. Dozier with a convenient hop one away. And that'll bring up Ben and Tendi, but first we'll show you the twins out on the field. Robbie Grossman in left field. Byron Buxton in center, Max Kemmler in right. Escobar Polanco left side of the infield Dozier Maurer on the right side Jimenez behind the plate. Now Rosario getting the night off with the left hander price pitching. And Jimenez doing the catching with uh, Castro getting the night out behind the plate. Here is Ben Intendi. For Kyle Gibson's major league career the Red Sox have always been better than the Twins. Even a couple years ago when the Twins had a winning record. The ball hit to right. And Kepler will get behind it. And Intende jumps on the first pitch for a single. And that'll bring up Xander Bogarts. Let's go to Kevin Gord. Yeah, Dick, it's time for our car soup scoop from the clubhouse. Paul Mauder was very impressed with the outing by Dylan G yesterday in Rochester. Certainly one of the options he'll have as a 26th man for the doubleheader in Kansas City on Saturday. He's got Sano DH tonight. Said nothing much to that other than the busy weekend ahead with those four games in three days. Wanted to give Miguel a little chance to catch his breath here with all the hype around the uh, home run derby and the all-star and all that good stuff that he's been dealing with with all the interviews here in Boston. And certainly for the Minnesota Twins right now, they're excited about the opportunity to watch their teammate get it done. Paul Mauder said he's a huge fan of the home run derby to watch the best in the business go along, including one of his guys. It's going to be a lot of fun for everyone. Well, thank you, Kevin. The batter's Xander Bogarts, and he takes strike one. Remember the, I believe the last twin to participate in the home run derby was Justin Morneau, and everyone remembers well, Brian Dozier, of course, at Target Field uh, participated. But uh, Morneau won it the year that Josh Hamilton at Yankee Stadium hit so many home runs in the second round, and he was exhausted by the third round, and <laughs> Justin had enough left to win the home run derby. There's a lot of swings, and that's probably a concern for some folks with Miguel going to be in it. But uh, that'll be a fun time. Certainly, the guys that are the big boppers, you'd want to get out there and show your stuff. I can't wait for the day when they just eliminate the pitcher. I think it cost Brian Dozier. He brought his brother in, couldn't throw strikes, <laughs> and they just need to put it on a tee. And that way, we really will know who's the strongest of the strongest. A strike to Bogarts. Gibson with great success here. We're talking about the Red Sox having you know, better talent, better teams than Gibson's tenure with the Twins, and yet he must feel comfortable here. And I'm sure you must have had mounds too, where you you got to the rubber and you just felt good out there because of some prior success. You know, the one thing psychologically I think Kyle might like about Fenway is it's short to the backstop. From the pitcher's mound, there it gives you the illusion that there's not a lot of foul territory. 
behind the catcher and sometimes that makes you feel like you're on top of home plate and you feel like you know I remember first time in the old Yankee Stadium it seemed like it was two miles behind the catcher right to the backstop and it made the distance of the 60 feet six inches seem like further than it was rounded foul and I know that's just a mind game but sometimes that's just the way you you know perceive it. I wonder your record at the Metrodome was so good. I mean, that had about oh, what, yeah. 25 feet behind home plate, wasn't it? Yeah, but I always attributed to it never any win. Yeah. 72 degrees. Yeah. Start a game, finish the game. He always had that invigorated feeling. Two strikes to Bogarts. Gibson, of course, adept at getting ground ball double plays, and he'd love to get one here. Near second base, fielded on the hop. And a weird one, but it's a double play. A soft line drive that landed near second base. Dozier cleaned it up, turned it into a double play, and it's one to nothing twin. Well, sometimes it's where the ball's hit, and this landed perfect for Dozier to be able to turn to. Second for the Twins, each team with a hit. David Price yielding a leadoff double to Dozier. The Twins worked him around to score. Opponent batting average this year for Price in his six prior starts, 237. That's pretty good. We'll see what Escobar can do here to start the second inning. Missing inside ball one. Well, Eduardo got an at bat yesterday, came in the game late, started to. The second game of this series and uh, ended up hitting a home run in the Boston bullpen off former teammate Fernando Abad, showing some power opposite field here at Fenway. One and one. Twin started the road trip with a three game sweep in Cleveland and now hoping to get a split here. This one flared down the right field line, a long run for Betts, and he got there. Good play by Mookie Betts. He plays right field as well as anyone. And this could be a tough right field to play. That's a great play for the first out. Well, like we've seen so many times from Byron Bucks and Mookie Betts, another one of those great young in outfielders who doesn't give up on balls. A lot of times a young guy will run hard and then say, I can't get there and pull up. But he continues to go for it. Buxton does that. And so many times when they go for it, they end up with the ball in their gloves. So great effort there, great catch. Pitchers appreciate that, don't they? Uh, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, a definite yes. <laughs> especially, right. especially when they don't see the back 
of their numbers chasing the ball towards the fence. <laughs> Here is Polanco taking strike one. But even when that happens, you still appreciate their effort. I'd rather them go for it. Missing the outside corner one and one. Nobody on base, you know, you take the chance. Right. I mean, if there's a runner on base, different story. Eighth, ninth inning may yeah, be different. Absolutely. Then you've got to be smart about what you do. But Mookie Betts has really established himself here in Boston as their right fielder of the future. One on one to Polanco. Out in front, one and two. Talking about the Twins' hopes for a split here. It's remarkable when you think about it. You know, the one loss record, I guess, uh, is an indicator. But here we are at the very end of June. Jack and the Twins have only lost two series on the road. Their very first one in the middle of April in Detroit, and then the one earlier this month in Seattle, and they should have won two out of three there. Fastball, and Polanco strikes out. Two down before Kepler's at bat. Let's get the big story in baseball from Kevin Gore. Yeah, guys, the big story, a really cool story, and off the field. Yesterday in Pittsburgh, umpire John Tumpain, 34 years old, walking on the Roberto Clemente Bridge near the stadium and saw a woman preparing to jump. The tone of her voice, the look on her face, told him something was wrong. He went to grab her and get her off there. She said, leave me alone. You'll forget me tomorrow. He said, I'll never forget you. A couple people came to help. They called 911 and they saved this woman's life. What an amazing story. He was the home plate umpire in that game between the Rays and the Pirates yesterday. Well, thank you, Kevin. It really is a remarkable story, and it brought to mind the story of Steve Palermo years ago, about 25 years ago. Palermo just passed away a couple of months ago. Kepler checks his swing. But uh, Palermo, while umpiring, broke up a, an armed robbery in Texas and ended up being shot. and. Uh, Suffering paralysis as a result of the shooting, but uh, that was another case of an umpire trying to come to the aid of someone they did not know. Kempler swings and misses. It's one and two. It's always remarkable how people react to situations, and thank goodness that Mr. Champagne did what he did. It took courage, but uh, right spot at the right time, I guess. One and two to Kepler and outside two and two. Two quick outs for the Twins here. David Price uh, seeming to find his rhythm a little bit. He doesn't have much of a delivery. In fact, now pitching out of the stretch. Kepler fights it off. One of the first guys to really simplify his windup. Just a short little baby step comes set to his waist and then tries to repeat his delivery over and over. It's just a step and a throw for David Price. Two two. Foul tip and Vasquez hangs on and Price has a one two three second inning. Adalberto Mejia has a couple of wins on this road trip. When we come back, we'll hear from him from Kevin Gord with the Twins leading 1 0.
The saddle early here at Fenway. It's a one nothing game as we go to the bottom of the second. And last night's hero, El Delbroto Mejia, is here with his translator, Carlos Font. And uh, what a game last night. Back to back road starts now, El Delberto. No runs against her on this road trip. What's clicking for you right now on the mound? No, no, me mantuve trabajando, preparándome para la próxima salida, para seguir manteniéndome, tratando de hacer mejor cada día, cada salida que haga. No, I'm just, I just keep getting more comfortable, more comfortable. You know, I keep getting ready every day uh, to do what I'm doing now. You know, I go out, prepare myself, look at what the uh, coaching staff wants me to do, and that's, that's how my success is coming. Long road trip, and it's fun to watch you guys get along, whether it's in the clubhouse, on the team bus. It's a close bunch, and you guys have a lot of success on the road. You've been a great road team all year. Why do you think that is? Come on. Que el equipo se vea bien este, aquí en la calle, aparte de que estamos ganando, pues nos llevamos bien en el clubhouse, en la guagua. ¿A qué se debe eso y que, cómo, cómo se ve el equipo? No, nosotros somos un equipo bien unido desde el sprint training, ya que nosotros hablamos y nos unimos uno con otro, tratamos de, de conversar de lo del juego, de fuera del juego. Y gracias a Dios este año ya es un equipo diferente y, y tratando de ser lo mejor para seguir ganando. No, we're a very close bunch. Even from spring training, it's something where we sat down and we all uh, talk to one another saying, hey, we're going to get along, we're going we're gonna to do this. And, we, you know, we go from, we can have a conversation about the game uh, or a random conversation that has nothing to do with the game. We, we just get along well and, and that's why, why we're playing so well. One of those teammates is Irvin Santana. How much do you learn watching that guy every day? Elvin, que uno de los jugadores con los cuales está más cercano es con Elvin, que este, que mucho aprendes de él, cómo te la llevas con él y lo que hacen juntos. Como la llevo muy bien, me la llevo bien ya que es un veterano de mi batalla, tiene muchos años en Grande Liga, tratando de aprender lo que él aporta a nosotros, eh, enfocándome más como él lo hace, trabajar más duro como él lo hace trabajando. No, yeah, he, you know, he's a veteran, so you have to follow the veteran. He's a great guy. He's a guy that I try to emulate and follow every single day. Uh, he's a guy that works hard and work, want to work just as hard as he does. Kyle Gibson making the play for the out there at first base. Last question for you. It's such a unique stadium here. The history, 105 years. What do you think of Fenway Park? Yo pienso que algo, algo, algo bien, ya que todo el mundo quisiera jugar aquí en este estadio. Un estadio con mucha historia, mucha leyenda que han pasado por aquí. Me sentí muy bien cuando piché anoche y gracias a Dios pude hacer un trabajo genial. It's awesome, you know, when you start thinking about all the people and all the legends that have played here, it's an honor to, to be able to pitch here. Last night I took it all in, I enjoyed it a lot, and, and it's awesome to be able to pitch at the stadium. Sure is fun to be here. Thanks so much for your time, both of you guys. Great to hear from you, and great to watch you have that success on the mound. Thank you. Guys, well, fun guy, fun teammate, and uh, having a lot of success right now on the mound. Thank you very much, and thanks to Adalberto. Thanks to Carlos Fond, who does a great yep. job. That's one of the best things baseball's done. Uh, in my tenure is to have a translator to to help the Latin ball players communicate with members of the media. It's long it was long overdue and Carlos does a great job. I you know especially with the twins I mean it's it, the twins have become much more Latin oriented and Carlos has kept pretty busy. He has been but I'm always uh, reminded and, and it just gives me a lot of pride to, to see these guys progress with their English. And yes. I say to myself why don't you learn Spanish Jack because uh, it's not easy especially when you're an adult and these guys are trying they learn it on the run and you got to give them credit for trying. I always felt uh, sympathetic to them trying to communicate in a second language because as you know I have a hard time communicating in <laughs> one but my primary language so I about 10 years ago uh, Miguel Ramos who, who works uh, the director of diversity for the twins we worked it out so Miguel would prepare questions in Spanish and I would try to read the questions in Spanish to the players and I was terrible at it I was awful uh, it was comical I'm sure for them but at least the in intent was good to try to right. get genuine thoughtful answers from them in the language that they are accustomed to speaking and listening to. Well, the bottom line is uh, he has been pitching very well and it's fun to win and I think uh, this team is starting to sense a little bit of that winning tradition and hopefully it'll carry over as the twins move forward. Ramirez fell the ball off his leg and missed a couple of days and Gibson with the sinker gets him to foul one off there again. You see he's got a little pad on his knee. Now that's kind of unique but this one gets his ankle or foot in step somewhere down there. And uh, it's he's all on the same leg, so he's having a lot of fun right now. 
He's still feeling it. Now, that's off that the, the back, back leg. leg. Yeah. Can't limp anymore. <laughs> The left leg hurts and the right leg hurts. Can't limp, can you? He's limping. But what I think he can't do is run. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be a setup, too. But I know Kyle Gibson could maybe run that sinker down and in again and see what happens. That'd be kind of fun. Two and two to Ramirez. Jackie Bradley Jr. on deck. That's softly into center. Dozier with a nice running catch in short center field. Got a great break on the ball. Ended up taking a perfect angle to pick it off. Two down. You got to get a good jump to be able to get to this ball. Brian was able to do that. He kind of sensed right away to get going over his right shoulder and runs it down. And Kyle Gibson, of course, appreciates it. He helped himself out with the first out, and now two quick outs. And Jackie Bradley Jr. with two down, and the base is empty. Missing inside ball one. So far in this game, Kyle has done a nice job of pitching in. And I think if he starts feeling confident in that, I know that his catcher, Chris. Jimenez is doing his part to encourage him to do that. Picked off by Maurer, a bullet for an out, and Gibson faces just three men in the second. Another at a ball, but it works. Baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by Northland Ford. Visit buyfordnow.com and your local Northland Ford dealer today. By Grand Casino, the best stories start here. And by Menards. Save big money at Menards on all your home improvement needs. Twins got a leadoff double from Brian Dozier. Worked him around to score. It's 1 nothing, and now Chris Jimenez will lead off the third for the Twins against David Price. Jimenez takes inside ball one Jimenez Buxton and Dozier here in the Twins third five that, home runs for Jimenez including one here the other night two and oh you mentioned the Twins got on the board first but it's been all pitching since then 
twice uh, got out of the first inning and then settled in with a clean one two three second inning. Gibson been doing a good job of throwing strikes. Ooh, wicked line drive might have hit the guide wire if not the netting. Jimenez was ready for that 2 0 pitch and he put, uh, pulled it viciously foul. The hole cut off by Marrero. Good fielding third baseman fires across one down. That'll bring up Buxton. Sanford Health Injury Report. Chris Giant, a Bryant, caught a pop up and stepped awkwardly on the corner of third base yesterday. X rays are negative. He's day to day. And Bryant, National League MVP last year. And they don't know how long he'll be out, but this Cubs team that Preordained to win the World Series again is just floating along at 539 and 39. Here's Buxton with one gone in the third. Strike one. As this game is progressing, David Price is throwing more off speed pitches and doing a better job of throwing them in the strike zone. And that means that he's saving those bullets, those high. High octane fastballs for certain situations. All oh, back on to the box. Another change up there. One and two. Buxton entered the game for defensive purposes, went 0 for 1 after coming into the game. And you saw the batting average dipping below 200. Dozier on deck. Well, back. It's afternoon. Cleveland behind Corey Kluber beat Texas 5 to 1. And Detroit beat Kansas City 7 to 3. It's the first series that the Royals have lost in June. And they're back below the 500 mark. Twins go to Kansas City after the game. All of them except Urban Santana, who left this afternoon to get a full night's sleep. Twins will get to their hotels in the neighborhood of 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning. Buxton takes outside 2 and 2. There'll be a lot of baseball in a very short time in Kansas City, but that's what you sign up for. And the players are very aware of what's about to happen. They're hoping they can get out of Boston here with a split of this series. Continue to have a nice road trip. Backhanded by Bogart. Sand Boston by half step is retired two down. That'll bring us to Brian Dozier. This Twins and Red Sox series on Fox Sports North is presented by Jeep. Visit Jeep.com to learn more. Dozier whacked the second pitch of the game off the wall in left center for a leadoff double. Grossman moved him to third with a fly ball. Maurer brought him in with a ground ball. Taking low, ball one. Brian Dozier, so well documented. What a great year he had with the power numbers last year 42 home runs. And I found it interesting in our pregame when he talked about how much he likes playing here because of that short left field porch. I wonder if he played here full time, if that would become a problem or not. Would it really be advantageous to him? Or would it. Uh, Force him to, to be honest with you, would it change his game at all? I mean, he wants to pull the ball. That's that's his strength, right? So I don't it know is. that I don't know that it would change his approach. He might have he, a little more success here with doubles, whatever. Tap foul. 
I've seen guys come into this ballpark and get messed up for quite some time because they get pull happy. Brian is pretty consistent with trying to pull the ball. He'll take two, two swings, most at bats, uh, or at least looking to pull. He's shown that he has the ability to go the other way, and that's something that gives everybody encouragement because he's got so many more hits sitting on the right side of the field sometimes. One and two to Dozier. But I think if he was to really look at things and look across the diamond, not tonight because Dustin Pedroia is not playing tonight. But uh, Pedroia isn't a guy that got pulled happy because of being in Fenway. He's willing to go the other way and it's a lot of hits because of it. Oh, playing on close two and two. Right there, David Price tried to run a fastball up and hopefully get Doge to chase. Brian can handle the high fastball. He can handle it sometimes, let her high. And will jump all over it, but that was just too high out of the zone. And now a full count with Grossman on deck. We've probably been as guilty of it as anybody, but you know, Dozier last year at this time was in the midst of his incredible home run streak. And so you'd like to say, well, that'll happen every year. It may never happen again for Brian Dozier to even come close to 42 home runs. It's his numbers from last year, one RBI away. Boy, I bet he wishes he has that one. <laughs> could knock in that one run. Full count to Dozier with two down. Remember, he didn't play the last game of the season. He just was worn down. He really struggled the last week or so of the season. And full count with two down on the top of the third. A high fly to center field. Going back is Bradley. And on the warning track makes the catch. Nine in a row set down by Price. You're watching Twins Baseball. Presented by State Farm. Fox Sports North is presented by Chevrolet, the number one selling brand in the Twin Cities. And by State Farm, here to help life go right with the home and auto protection you deserve. Already on this road trip, the Twins have pitched a couple of shutouts in Cleveland, an ear shutout last night. Kyle Gibson has faced the minimum through two innings here tonight. Christian Vasquez will lead off the third for Boston. And a first pitch strike, and now Gibson's five of seven in delivering first pitch strikes. And that's the reason we've seen a couple goose eggs already for Kyle. He's attacking that strike zone and early in the count. He 
went uh, three two on the first hitter and he's better been better ever since. Just off the corner. One and one. Nobody ever accused Kyle of being a high strikeout guy. He's a pitch to contact pitcher. That's what most sinker ball pitchers are. And uh, in order for them to succeed, they've got to throw a lot of strikes. And then later in the game, they might get hitters to start expanding the zone. But it's so important early in the game for Kyle to come out throwing the strikes. And depend on that defense. We talk about it all the time. Joe Maurer been absolutely incredible defender this year. Polanco, Dozier, today Escobar playing third, but Sano, got to trust your defense on the infield. One and two. Well, sure to short. Gives him getting some outs on the ground, including the first out of the third inning. Last night, Joe Maurer made a very athletic play at first base, the type of play that only a great athlete can make. Take a look at the play last night, then we'll flash back to a play he made from behind the plate at Yankee Stadium. Well, two guys dove for that ball, both Dozier and Maurer. Maurer didn't come up with it, but he had the mindset to get back and get his foot on the bag before the runner touches it. It was a bang bang play, but they reviewed it and Mejia did not cover first, but Joe Maurer did, and they recorded a very important out in that game right there. Another first pitch strike to Su Wei Lin. It'll be followed by Devin Marrero. And another strike, 0 and 2. Gibson with. 31 pitches thrown, 21 strikes, and a 68% strike percentage. Outstanding. Yeah, he can't. He can't do any much, much better than that. He's been coming after him, and I think the more he does that, the more he's going to want to do it. Chris Jimenez, obviously calling the game that Kyle's hoping for. They're working together well, and there's something about Fenway here. You see, Jimenez point to that plate. Keep this one down. It's going to be a breaking ball. Kyle keeps it down. Check swing, but he did check. Pretty good take by Lynn there. Those are the subtle little things catchers can do to help encourage you with your focus. Jimenez, the consummate pro, pointing to the plate, encouraging Kyle to keep it down. If you can miss, miss down. And a liner in the middle of the plate, black into center field. It's a one out single for Lynn. Let's go back to the most athletic play I've ever seen a catcher make at Yankee Stadium. Bluffing a throw to first and getting Brett Gardner, who at the time was one of the fastest runners in the American League. Uh, just a tremendous play showing off his athleticism behind the plate. Of course, he won gold gloves behind the plate, and I, I sure hope he wins one this year because he's just been outstanding. At first base for the Twins. Here's Devin Marrero, the third baseman. Another first pitch strike. So Gibson, first time through the order, has delivered seven first pitch strikes. One strike. You know, I know there's kind of a cardinal rule that pitchers should never give up two strike hits. No balls, two strikes. You're 0 2 on the hitter. You're always supposed to miss, but I think it's sometimes you can throw that away with sinker ball guys. And the fact that they're filling up the strike zone a lot because they can start expanding as the game goes on more than a strikeout type pitcher, I think. Uh, when guys know the ball's around the plate a lot. They're going to start swinging at pitches because they have to defend the plate. And uh, Kyle's always been one of those guys to try to make the perfect pitch early in the game. And I think he might start learning that throwing more of the plate, throwing the ball over more of the plate early in the game will allow him to open up the plate more as the game goes on. Right now, his pitch count's in really good shape. We don't see this every day from Kyle. But he's been throwing strikes. 
Rogers does a great job holding runners. He checked Lynn at first base. Just one successful steal against Kyle this year in three tries. Well, he's a guy that someday might win a gold glove. He's a great defending pitcher. He knows how to field his position and he he's got a the kind of delivery that complements a gold glove because he squares off to the hitter and has a good follow through. A pitcher here that Gibson reminds me of he was a really good starting pitcher and closer for a while Derek Lowe same type of build you know tall lanky big sinker ball a runner goes and the pitch foul back. Well Derek Lowe was he had one of the best sinker balls I've ever seen and Kyle's you know he doesn't have that kind of movement but body type and all that. Yeah I, I, I see where you're coming from there. Obviously there have been a lot of base runners on base against Gibson with uh, all the hits the bloated ERA even 33 walks and 65 innings but he's always been able to control the running game it's not just the one successful steal there have only been three attempts now Lynn that time was taking off this time he stays put just missed inside two and two one of the things Kyle has uh, really should be working on is avoiding that ugly inning. Here's a guy that can cruise along for a couple innings and look, make it look easy, quite honestly. And then we talked about that with Jose Barrios, the young pitcher, how you manage the game when trouble starts coming your way. Bouncer to short. That'll work. Should be two. One. And two. Gibson gets his second ground ball double play of the evening. He's faced the minimum number of batters through three innings. Pitcher's best friend, Polanco, Dozier, Maurer. Love playing in Fenway Park. Huge fan of the fans. Awesome atmosphere to be in. Always an awesome atmosphere. Tough place to be a visiting player. Great fans, they wear you out, but I think their time has come and gone. Great place to play a good baseball game. <laughs> Jimenez isn't afraid to, <laughs> to stir things up, is it? How about before the four game sweep, the Indians handed the Twins and he, he uh, acknowledged the Indians were kind of the bullies and it was time to punch them in the mouth. <laughs> and the Indians sweep all four games. And then Jimenez in Cleveland has a nice series and the Twins sweep them there. You know, I, I became neighbors <laughs> at one time in my life with former NBA player Bill Lambert, one of the members of the Bad Boys and the Pistons back to back years. And Billy loved to come into Boston as an instigator. He sure. absolutely thrived on the other team and the other fans booing him. And maybe. Jimenez is just trying to see what that feels like. I don't know. <laughs>
Well, I was talking with you before the game. I, I love coming here. This is just a joy to be here. We've had, for the most part, really good weather. We had one night of some weather issues, but this is this is a castle. If you're a baseball fan, here's a ball hit into the corner, fair by a foot, and into the crowd. So it'll be a leadoff double for Grossman here in the fourth inning. Well, the last time the Twins had a leadoff double, it turned into a run. Brian Dozier did just that in the first inning. So here in the fourth inning, uh, leadoff man Robbie Grossman does the same thing. Not fan interference, but a ground rule double. It was fair just by inches. And now Maurer, who drove in the run with a ground ball to short, will try to advance Grossman at least to third base. Twins to execute it perfectly after the leadoff double in the first inning. And Grossman's fly out to center was a very productive out. Well, I think Fenway in Boston is growing on me. I've always enjoyed the city, I guess, and, and I've always enjoyed the weather up here in the Northeast. You know, it kind of reminds me of our weather in Minnesota. Strike on the outside corner. But old ballparks never did much for me, and I think it's like fine wine. It's taking time to, okay. you know, for me to embrace it. Well, next year, we'll uncork a series <laughs> at Wrigley Field. Yeah, I've been there. You know, I wasn't there until they were in the World Series. It wasn't Is until right? last year. One strike to Mauer. Outside one and one. Well, I asked you about this before the game. This is such a wonderful atmosphere. I can only imagine what it's like in the postseason. But you experienced yeah, I, that. I, I did. I was uh, covering the World Series the last time uh, Boston won. And yeah, it's it's a little different. There was a lot more energy around this ballpark. But we sense that when we come in here because, and I I mentioned it to you, Dick, before the game. There's nothing prettier than a full ballpark. Yeah. Right. And it really does add to the whole experience for everyone, not just the players, but for the fans themselves to see other fans embracing their team. Well, we and we know why. I mean, it's no secret. You've got to have a contender on the field. And we experienced that at Target Field, brand new ballpark, a championship ball club. Twins won the division that year, and the place was full every night for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that's the hope that the Twins will get back to that as they. Uh, Hope to contend all this year and maybe get into postseason play. One and two to Maurer. Price still very much a strikeout pitcher. And Joe trying to put the ball in play here. Well, David has really been quite remarkable in his career. He's had Five times in the last six years, 200 plus strikeouts during the season. And that doesn't include his postseason stuff. He's been in a lot of postseasons in the last decade. So, not the, not the type of resume he would love to have in postseason, but he's still been there. Mauer, six for 35 in his career against David Price. Big hole for Joe at shortstop right now. Oh, Marlin caught it on the ground. Nobody there. And Maurer will reach. We saw this last night with Mejia and David Price kind of uh, freezing and not reacting. I guess sometimes you don't realize that a first baseman can make such a fine play, and you're watching. And of course, that's the catcher's job immediately. Get over there. That's something that is just imprinted. David Price did not get over there, and Joe Maurer gets another hit because of it. And actually, a pretty nice base running play by Grossman. He held his ground. You saw Moreland's first look was at Grossman. There was no play at third base, and by the time Moreland stood up, he realized he probably wasn't going to have a play at first base either. But if Grossman had taken off, there would have been a throw across the diamond and maybe potentially an out. As it is, first and second, nobody out for Sano. Chop, foul, one strike. Sano with a fly ball to right, hauled in by Betts in the first inning. You know, that's another thing about Boston, and I can, I'll always acknowledge this. 
These are very knowledgeable baseball fans that come to this ballpark. They were booing David Price there and it wasn't because of his latest incident with the press. He didn't cover first. Right. They would have done that with any pitcher here in Boston. You're supposed to cover first and you forgot to. David knows it. Price a couple of weeks ago announced he was done dealing with the press. <laughs> which <laughs> that doesn't work. Already tense relationship became even more tense because of his refusal to cooperate with the, the media. And he was not that type of guy in Toronto or Detroit or Tampa Bay. I always found him to be very accessible. So no checked his swing or did he? He did check. One and one. Let's look at uh, the base running for Robbie Grossman. You've got a freeze and he doesn't see this ball as it's going towards Mitch Moreland that it's going to be a ground ball. It looked like a, a line drive. Right. So he does what he's supposed to do. He freezes and then goes back to the bag and there was that kind of period of seconds is all that both Moreland and Grossman didn't know what was going to happen. So both of them just did what they're supposed to do and stay where where you are. Twins have the makings of an inning here. A leadoff double. Maurer with a smash with two strikes turns into an infield hit. And now a hitter's count for Miguel Sano. Two and one. And didn't get the fastball now, he was looking for. For most guys right there in that count, David Price would rear back and throw the 95 mile an hour fastball. But that's showing Miguel Sano respect in his power. He throws the changeup, turns it over, throws it down. Miguel more susceptible to the ball down than he is the one up. He doesn't chase up in the zone very often, but he will go after that one down. Strikeout pitcher against a hitter prone to striking out, but also a run producer. Just off the edge. And it's three and two. And it was well off the plate. Christian Vasquez, the catcher, will move left to right and set up actually right off the plate. So David Price could hit his glove, but it's still a ball because he's not setting up on the corner. And so no strikes out on another changeup, one down. A lot of times that's an indication that David's getting his rhythm. When he's willing to throw three, two changeups, and he's able to execute it the way the last pitch was. Let's look at the sequence of pitches. There's a bunch of them, but only one above 90 miles an hour. So he threw a lot of off-speed changeups. That might have been the Big. only one that was actually a strike. Big out right there. In the strike zone. It is a big out, one down, and now Escobar in a line drive to right. Betts made a nice running catch toward the foul line. Fastball, strike one. That fastball only 90 miles an hour, and that's not what we're used to seeing from David Price. Chasing at 96. Well, unlike Sano, Escobar is susceptible to the high fastball, and and now Vasquez is going to talk to David Price. I know what this conversation is. Hey, throw it up there again. Now make sure you check the runner at second. Don't forget about him. Give me a chance. But uh, Eduardo's got to lay off that pitch. He rarely makes contact with the ball up over his shoulders. Two strikes to Escobar. Been the Twins' hottest hitter in the month of June. Fought it off to stay alive. I've never seen what I just saw. Vasquez faked a target high and then put his glove low, way, way down by the plate. Huh? 
If I'm pitching, that messes me up. You know? I think it's because of the runner at second base trying to tip location. See where he goes up, and then his target is low. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that's why he went out there to remind him. Maybe thought thought he saw Grossman tipping pitches. Who knows? If not the pitch itself, the location. Well, that's on the catcher, isn't it? If he sets up too early. Yeah, it's on the catcher because the it gives the hitter time to maybe make an adjustment. One and two to Escobar. Twins trying to expand the lead here in the fourth inning. Saw Vasquez going to his catching arm there. Went through a set of touches on his left arm with his right arm, and then he gave signals. Now there, there could be something that both are signs. One for the infielders or the shortstop in this case, or the second baseman, whoever's holding on Grossman, and the other one for the pitcher. But I remember Doyle Alexander when he came to Detroit, he did not use fingers. For signs, he used wipes, and where the catcher touched Is his right? arm. So everybody's got their own unique way of calling a game. See how he's touching his arm there? That doesn't happen every day. Another one-two to Escobar. That is a foul ball. Making Price work. This will be his 65th pitch. He's only gotten 10 outs. In yesterday's game, pitch count became an issue for Rick Porcello. And David Price, no different. He has always thrown a lot of pitches, gone deep into a lot of games. Taken for ball two. His pace of game really slows with base runners. It always has. You know, say here it's gotten worse this year. <laughs> well, maybe he's had more base runners. That could be. Two and two. High now three and two. As was the case before, really not much you can do with the runners here. Sano ended up striking out on a changeup. Well, I gotta believe he wants to still throw the fastball up. We'll see how he works Escobar here. Eduardo getting tired of waiting, so he steps out. The count now full to Escobar. Hit to right field, retreating his bets, tagging his Grossman. First and third with two down for Jorge Polanco. Second time that Escobar's hit a fly ball to Betts in right field. You can follow Twins Baseball Live with the MLB.com at bat mobile app. Stay connected to the game's best players all season long with game day, live game video highlights, radio broadcasts, stats, news, and more. Download MLB.com at bat today, your number one app for live baseball. Polanco went down swinging his first time up. Vasquez giving signs in front of the plate. In the event uh, the Twins try to get uh, exotic here with a double steal of some sort. Gibson hoping that he'll take the mound in the bottom of this inning with more than a one run lead. Big hole on the right side of the infield, and Polanco staring right at it. Strike one. See where Lynn is playing very near second base, and of course, Moreland's holding on with Maurer. 
pitchers and hitters are are, you, are similar in, in the fact that both of them like to get in some kind of rhythm. And uh, Kyle Gibson on the bench here. He's been in a good rhythm. He's throwing strikes. Long half inning without a run crossing the plate yet. And it's got to upset him a little bit. He's just got to be patient. Nothing he can do. But when you're pitching well, you want to get back out there unless the guys are putting a lot of points on the board. Well, we're checked at first. Five innings or pitches this fourth inning. 70th pitch of the game for Price coming up here and a 1 1 count to Polanco. Foul back 1 and 2. We're quite a ways away from the pitcher's mound where our perch is up here. Uh, in our broadcast booth. But David Price has always been a grunter. And I can hear him grunting. Now, two days in a row, I yelled from this position down to the batting cage trying to get Carl Willis's attention. <laughs> he never heard me, but I can hear David Price grunting. So you know the sound travels here, just <laughs> maybe just in one direction. <laughs> Only up, I guess. There's the train. So you never hooked up with him? I did not okay. talk to him. Okay. Two and two to Polanco. And a drive to left field. This ball is hit back and off the very top of the wall. Mauer rounding third. He will try to come home with the second run. And it's a two run double for Jorge Polanco. Three to nothing, Twins. He almost cleared the monster. Good to see Polanco graded a fastball. David Price, again, he's the guy that sometimes, I, I don't know, I just I don't understand his thinking sometimes. This is actually a changeup, but the ball left right over the plate, and he didn't really change speeds that much. It was a hard changeup. But you could see by the fact that it rolled off his pinky and ring fingers. It was a changeup. Polanco didn't miss it. And now Kyle Gibson's got three runs to work with. What a big two out, two strike hit for Jorge Polanco. Here's Kepler. Inside, ball one, and the pitch count. This inning continues to mount for Price. in the inning and Price's inability to cover first base on the Mauer ground ball big big play that should have been the first out and Escobar's fly ball should have been the third out yeah David has himself to blame for that one he should be in the dugout right now with no out or with no runs here's the play we we're talking about Joe Mauer hits a sharp ball to Moreland Orland dives to his right, but you see the reaction time for David Price. He doesn't cover first. Nobody there. Moreland can't throw it to anybody, can't beat Mauer to first. And that was an out that was not recorded because the pitcher didn't react the way he's supposed to. Good base running from Joe, especially on Polanco's double. 30th pitch of this inning. And Kepler saw it off. A little pop-up to Bogarts will end the inning. But a big two out double for Jorge Polanco. The lead is now three to nothing.
Bellinger going to make it two in a row over the Sox. Toyota will allow us to get caught up. Well, Joe Maurer hits the ball. Brian Dozier scores after a leadoff double. Then Jorge Polanco with two runners aboard hits one high off the wall here in Boston. And Joe Maurer scores from first base. Good base running there. He beats the catcher Christian Vasquez to the plate. And Kyle Gibson a clean first three innings minimum amount of batters faced. He's been working ahead in the count. He's got three runs to work with now as he goes to the bottom half of the fourth inning. A rare first pitch ball and now a blast to left and the Red Sox are on the board. Off the light standard and a home run for Mookie Betts. It's three to one. Take a look at this pitch. Jimenez sitting away. Gibson throws it right on the corner in. And one of the reasons Kyle has had a tough time pitching in is because of that right there. It seems like every time he makes a pitch in, somebody does something that he doesn't like, like home runs or doubles or something. And now back in the strike zone with the first pitch to Ben and But that's clearly a pitch that missed by six, six or eight inches. He was setting up away and he left it in and attendee singled in the first was doubled up on a ground ball later in the inning squibbed foul that's pulls his hands in that was kind of the typical Derek Jeter swing inside out swing barrels up the ball got out of here in a hurry but he just got in on Andrew Benintendi with that last fastball two strikes to Benintendi in a three to one game. Just the second run that Gibson's given up here at Fenway Park in 18 innings. Yeah, you just got to put that in the rearview mirror. Don't even worry about that. You still got two runs with. Don't change your game plan. Big pop up right side, Dozier in short right field. With the catch one away. It'll bring up Bogarts. Fox Sports Supports is proud to team up with Positive Coaching Alliance and its mission to develop better athletes, better people by working to provide all youth and high school athletes a positive character building sports experience. Visit FoxSportsSupports.com to learn more. It's an anniversary in baseball. Were you aware of this, Jack Morris? That 112 years ago today, Moonlight Graham got into his only game. And then eventually retired from professional baseball and became a doctor in Chisholm, Minnesota for 50 years. Gold moonlight. That's yeah, I don't remember. Well, I know you're probably you trying to insinuate that I was there and I was. No, no, but no. I, I don't remember. One strike to Bogart. Was immortalized in the movie Field of Dreams. Chop foul. 0 and 2. Are you a fan of nicknames for baseball players? I am if they come from the clubhouse or the players themselves. I, I don't think nicknames should come from up in the press box, and that's, I guess, where most of them come from. How about if you name yourself like Big Game James? <laughs> that's that's the worst. That's the worst. Did he give himself that name? Yeah, absolutely. Did he really? Yes. He was teasing. Oh, well, he was that's not teasing, good. but it stuck. You know, he was just. Back in those days when he was pitching for Tampa, he was kind of making fun of the rest of his teammates. He's, you got to step up like big game James. Okay. And I didn't know that. Stuck. It's kind of like how Carl Willis got the nickname the train. One and two, and now two and two. You were blackjack, but you also told me a week or so ago uh, Sparky Anderson had a nickname for you. Well, Sparky called every guy named Jack Cactus. And so in Detroit, <laughs> my name was Cactus, and that's all we're going to say about that. I don't want any ideas as to why. But okay, the only person who ever called me Blackjack was John Gordon. Nobody, oh, is that right? Nobody ever called me Blackjack. People in Minnesota. Kinda, oh, but your your nickname. Uh, my my you, nickname is Jack. Right. My real right. name is John. But nobody ever called you like Cracker Jack. <laughs> I've been called everything, <laughs> but. <laughs> As far as a consistent <laughs> no. nickname, no. 
when you're toting around my first name you get called a lot of things too. <laughs> That's a foul ball. Still two and two to Bogarts. Gibson trying to shrug off the bets home run. Yeah. Well yeah, there's a lot of baseball yet here to be played tonight. Kyle Gibson. A lot better off than David Price as far as pitch count. Only 51 tosses so far so that's pretty good for Kyle. In fact it's very good. Got him with an off speed pitch two down. Good off speed pitch there Kyle hasn't thrown a lot of those but Bogart's very susceptible to it. See how he's way out in front balls down and has a little movement. There it is you see the change up grip that circle change. Two down now and Mitch Moreland. For a one hopper back to Gibson his first time up. First strikeout for Kyle. Missed the inside corner, ball one. Well, there's another anniversary. Today is another uh, baseball anniversary that you were actually involved in. It's it's a footnote in Twins history, so I don't expect you to remember it at all. You were with the Tigers at the time. Ground ball to second. Actually scooped up by Polanco. On this date, 1984, Andre David hit a home run at Tiger Stadium against Jack Morris, and it was the only home run he hit in his big league career. I'll have time to explain. <laughs> Of the Minnesota Lottery. Well, Randy Moss came back and uh, played for the Vikings, and Kevin Garnett came back and played for the Timberwolves. And last year I interviewed David Ortiz and uh, thought he'd uh, announce during the interview that he'd come back to the Twins, but he laughed and said no. Here's Chris Jimenez to start the fifth inning, and he takes strike one. Well, when they give him a jar of peanut butter <laughs> as his parting gift, I mean, it doesn't really entice a guy to come back. Jimenez, Buxton, and Dozier facing Price in the fifth. All right, you could felt compelled to, to want to tell the story about Andre David. I just threw okay. it out there. How Andre David, career minor leaguer, right? Played right. Long time in yep. the Twins minor league system. Gets called to big league. I don't know who Andre David is, right? Never. Right. Never heard of the guy. And a lot of times you go out there. And we, we didn't have scouting reports the way they do now. <laughs> I didn't have any video to go okay. watch. I didn't know his exit velocity 
and all those kind of things. So what do you do? You throw fastball over first pitch and he whacked it and he gets a home run. And then I find out later that you know that's his first home run. And then I find out like years later from him that was his only home right. run. First at bat. And I, I gotta let you know for he wasn't the only guy. <laughs> There's a handful of guys that that was true about. Two and two to Jimenez. I remember uh, there was a guy out in uh, Seattle that I gave up his first, and he didn't get a lot. But in the first at bat, his very first at bat. I think it was. Okay. Two and well, two I mean, to Jimenez. First at bat off me. Right. Picked up by Marrero. Nice play. Jimenez retired one away. Well, in Twins history, there have been seven hitters hitting a home run in their first at bat. Good, another look at Marrero. Yeah, he's got a long way to go. That he reaches out, gets the ball, and then a nice quick spin move. And an accurate throw to first. 1968, Rick Rennick, who later was, of course, a coach for the Twins, third base coach for the Twins in the World Championship year, he had a Home run in his first at bat against Mickey Lolich. Dave McKay, longtime major league coach. Buxton jabbing at it, strike one. Dave McKay in his first at bat hit a home run against Vern Rule. My first roommate in the big leagues. And then Gary Gaetti against Charlie Huff in 1981. Andre David in 84. We've covered that enough. Luke Hughes did it in his first at bat against Max Scherzer. Eric Fryer did it. Actually, it was his first at bat as a twin. Here's the ball lifted to right center field, chased by Bradley, still going back, and in the triangle, and makes the catch two down. Great route right there by Jackie Bradley Jr. went right to the ball. Join us Saturday, August 5th, for the women's baseball experience. Twins clinician and members of the coaching staff will be providing instruction at Target Field. Participants will get the full experience of what it's like being a Major League Baseball player. To learn more and register today, visit twinsbaseball.com slash women's clinic. So Eric Fryers doesn't count because he actually had a couple of at-bats with the Pirates and then Eddie Rosario, the first pitch he saw, boom, left field home run. Moral of the story, a bunch of guys hit the ball off. <laughs> yeah. Home runs happen, right? It's part of baseball, yeah. Once in a while, except okay. for Jim Palmer never gave up a grand slam. But nobody nobody thinks about the pitchers that gave them up. But it, I mean, can you imagine if you're a hitter and you've taken thousands and thousands of swings getting to the big leagues and you get there and in your first at bat you hit a home run. Where do you go from there? Well, I told you my story about my teammate Mick Kel Kelleher, didn't I? We'll save that for next half. Of the Count to Dozier one and one. Got a double, a run scored, and a fly to center. Now a called strike, and it's one and two. Twins haven't scored a tremendous amount of runs on the this road trip, but they've they've been runs that have mattered because yeah. they pitched their tails off. That's yeah. been the best part of this for me. There's a tap of Price. Play Plants there. and fires, and the ball gets by Moreland and goes into the oh. camera well. So Dozier should get an infield hit. Be an error charge to Price, and Dozier will end up at second base. Well, David did a great job. David Price did a great job of getting off the mound and getting to this ball, but he never got his feet underneath him when he planted. You can see he had to stand straight up, and because of that, he couldn't make an accurate throw. He kind of slipped a little bit there, had to stand straight up. The ball goes in the dirt. Moreland couldn't pick it. And then it goes into the camera well over at first base. So Brian gets second base. No chance for the Twins to get another two out hit here that might produce a run. Grossman doubled down the left field line, leading off the fourth, and then he scored on Polanco's two out double. Single for Dozier, air charge to Price, and a runner at second with two down. High hop fielded by Marrero. 
And out. We'll see whether the Twins challenge. Jeff Smith, first base coach, doesn't seem too interested as he turns his back to the infield. And it looks like the Twins are done here in the fifth. They lead it three to one. up three to one first pitch to Anley Ramirez and he tried to make it a three two ball game Pepsi fans of the game a lot of twins caps here at the ballpark a lot of twins gear on the streets of Boston in these four game series whether they're here or Seattle or Toronto great for fans to make the trip and maybe catch more than one game uh, at a visiting ballpark like Kansas City you could go down yeah watch this Next series down in KC. You know that's a good point. I'll be curious to see how many Twins fans are there. The Royals of course got off to a bad start. They've been winning lately, but boy, the Twins traveled awfully well to Kansas City for so many years. I saw a lot of Royals fans the last time they were in town in yeah. Target Field, so they were curious to see the new ballpark and watch their team. One and two to Ramirez, lined out to Dozier his first time up just a. On our second out of the inning. On our set out in right field, the target field the other day. We were playing the heck were we playing? White, White Sox, Sox, maybe? White Sox, I think it was. And a guy came by, two guys came by with Royals shirts on. I told them they were lost. I said Kansas City <laughs> about seven hours south. No two and two to Ramirez with Jackie Bradley Jr. on deck. After Kansas City, the Twins are home for seven, three with the Angels and four with the Orioles. And then the All Star break. Two and two to the leadoff man here in the Boston fifth. Full count. Gibson hasn't walked anybody. That was one of his issues in his start in Cleveland. He didn't yeah. quite finish five innings because he walked four men in four and two thirds. The Indians built a threat in the fifth inning, and Paul Molitor had to make a bullpen move. Well, he's been throwing strikes here tonight. He's only recorded one strikeout, but no walks, like you mentioned. And just the leadoff home run from Mookie Betts. 60th pitch of the night for Kyle Gibson. 
Check swing. Did he go? No. Very close check. And Ramirez takes a leadoff walk. Yep, he checked. Jackie Bradley Jr. comes to the plate. He lined to Mauer to end the second inning. Cog could use that ground ball here again. See if that sinker can get himself out of some more trouble. It got him out of a one out hit from uh, Su Wei Lin. He's had a couple double plays already in this game. Pitch in the dirt ball one. Jimenez will bring a new baseball back to Gibson. Talked about you know this road trip. And the Twins with a four and two mark in it, but it's the scores of the wins that have to be gratifying, certainly to Neil Allen and Paul Molitor, but hopefully Twins fans too. The four wins, remembering that the Indians were averaging over seven and a half runs a game before the Twins came to town. Five to nothing, four to two, four to nothing, and then last night, four to one. Some well pitched games, and uh, starters have been adequate. Cleveland but the bullpen outstanding there last night I thought I thought Mejia did a really nice job of uh, navigating into the sixth inning and then the bullpen again did their job and those games seem to be so much cleaner when, when you get a decent effort from the starting pitcher Kyle Gibson in all honesty if you can have a clean inning here pretty good effort. Love to see him into the seventh, but uh, you'll take whatever you get from this point as long as they don't score. One and one to Bradley after the leadoff walk. Gibson, of course, pitching from the stretch. And now two and one. In June, Gibson and his five prior starts. Three and one with an ERA of 4.13, and a dozen walks in 28 and a third inning, which is more in line with what he established earlier in his career. Now three and one with Christian Vasquez on deck. Now, for whatever reason, Kyle's starting to miss fire. That was a fastball that missed again by 10 to 12 inches. Kind of just really pulled that ball, and this is where he's got it. Try to keep his body under control. Finish off in front, right towards the catcher's glove. Fill up that strike zone. To left. Grossman plays the bounce. It hit the ladder. And Hanley Ramirez jogs to third. Here's a throw to the plate, not in time. Talking about this the other night, I'd never seen a ball hit the ladder, and that one did. It's an RBI double on a 3 1 pitch, and it's 3 to 2. You know, Robbie Grossman turned around and he was prepared to really play the ricochet off the monster. You see this pitch up and away. Bradley just stays with it, but it ends up going right into the ladder and it kind of shakes its way down a little bit. Robbie has to go get it because it did not ricochet. You see it bob bouncing around in the ladder. And Hanley doing what Hanley does, just sort of. He was going to pull up there, but third base coach Brian Butterfield says, get your runs home. And he did. Tying run at second, nobody out. Vasquez, the seventh place hitter. Right, the inside corners. So now Gibson's got to pitch his way out of this inning to keep the lead. Well, I know this is going to come as a surprise to you, but how about a leadoff walk coming in to score? Yeah. And falling behind Bradley three and one didn't help either. No activity in the Twins pen, so at this point, Paul Molitor. Wants Kyle to work himself out of his own jam, and that's part of learning in this game. Damage control. I think uh, Jose Barrios is starting to learn what it means, and he wants Kyle Gibson to 
Get out of his own mess here. I like it. Sharply hit. Knocked down by Polanco. May have been screened a bit I, by I gotta, Bradley. I really think that's exactly what happened. Jackie Bradley, the base runner, was right in front of Jorge Polanco. And I'm not sure he read the hop correctly. You can see where he is. He's getting his lead. Doesn't react to the baseball. He and, was uh, kind of set up with his glove open in front of him and then ended up having to backhand that. They give Polanco an error. First and second. And now Su Wei Lin may be asked to bunt. First and second, nobody out. The Red Sox making some noise here. They got a run on the fourth on the Betts home run, but then Gibson got the next three batters, and the ball never left the infield. And now a leadoff walk, double off the ladder and left, an error. And we'll see if Lynn is asked to bunt. Corner infielders are cheating already. Away, ball one. Well, there's a little cross up that happened right there. Jorge Polanco flashed the glove. It's the daylight play. He went to second base, and Kyle never picked it up. So the entire shortstop area watches Polanco breaks and flashes the glove. And when he flashes the glove, Kyle's got to either step off or throw to second because what's happening is Polanco's vacating the shortstop, and there's a hole as big as Pennsylvania there. Over the inside corner, one and one. And Buddy Boucher is getting loose with Gibson running into a lot of trouble here in the fifth inning. Well, Kyle can feel this position. He can get off that mom pretty good. So and it's a force play at third base. Right. Too. Right. So if he can just get to the ball, there's a good chance. With Eduardo Escobar playing as close to third base as he is, that Kyle can help his cause and get the lead runner at third. It all depends on whether Lynn bunts the ball down and where he is. To Gibson, nobody at second base because of the bunt defense. And Gibson, had he thought about it, might have had a play at third. But of course his reaction right away was to look at second and there was no one there. Second and third one down so it's as if Lynn actually laid down a bunt. Well Kyle does a great job reacting to this ball and his reaction is perfect. But nobody there. Polanco's going to third to cover in case Escobar charges the bunt. Which means Dozier was the one to get back to second base and Brian didn't do that. Well, anticipating the bunt, though, you can see Brian running toward first base because if Maurer had to field the bunt, somebody needed to be yep. at first base. So it's kind of a tough break for Gibson. That's a tough play period in bunt situation, but there's got to be communication of who's going to second. Right. And it it usually doesn't unfold until the ball is bunted. In this case, it wasn't. It was swung at. So that's where the confusion came in. Marrero, 103 at bats. 37 strikeouts the infield in and Gibson if not a strikeout would like a ground ball hit at somebody to freeze the runner at third. Marrero hit into a double play his first time up. Chopped foul. I've talked about it many times that I think in today's game strikeouts are overrated. Because pitch count in the game today strikeouts lead to high pitch counts and you don't get to finish games or get deep in the games. But there are times where strikeouts are so important. This would be one of those times. Either an infield fly ball, a foul ball, or a strikeout. Those are the three things that a pitcher would love to get right here. Wins outfield is shortened up considerably for the Marrero at bat. Little low. Gibson wants to stay if he wants to get a ground ball hit at somebody, I would think. At or below the knees. Marrero known for a good glove, and they can use that at third base here in Boston. They've had a lot of turnover at third base. 
not known as much of a hitter. Batting average at 165. A chopper. Escobar has no choice. Has to make the play at first and the game is tied. Didn't hit it hard enough for the infield in to come into effect. And Bradley scores from third and it's three apiece. Well, this ball hits the plate and just really one of those high choppers. It's it would take one heck of a play for Escobar to be able to throw a strike home because you have to throw it right on the plate. Yeah, it, it, so he does the right thing there. The very thing that was in play with the first and second situation, the force play was not a factor there. It would have to have been a tag. So now two down, the go-ahead run at third, and Betts who clobbered a home run off the light pole, leading off the fourth inning. And a first pitch strike. Oh. High chopper up the middle and into center field. Betts with a single. Vasquez scores and the Red Sox take a 4 3 lead. Well, that'll go down as an unearned run there, more than likely, but seeing high base hit, again, the ball hits the dirt in front of home plate and finds a way and finds that hole between. Polanco and Dozier, neither one of them could quite get to the ball. So the Red Sox get a big two out hit to take a 4 3 lead. And now Andrew Benintendi. Betts can do it all, including steel bases. He's got a dozen and 14 tries. Down and away, ball one. And a reminder this inning all started with a leadoff walk. It was an error. Two and zero. Oh. Gibson having the type of inning here that Price had in the fourth. Buddy Boschers getting loose now in the Twins pen. He's had a three nothing lead. Now it's four three Boston. And having problems throwing strikes again. Out of the stretch, it's been a struggle a little bit here in this inning. He's came into the game or through the lineup the first time and did it in order. The most damaging pitch he threw was the 3 1 pitch to Bradley. That was hit for a double. Foul back when intended green lighted. The Red Sox have the lead. Three and one for the Red Sox rookie. 25 pitches this inning for Gibson, 79 in the game. In case you're wondering, well, you know, Gibson's losing it here. I think what we're seeing with Gibson still on the mound is the factor of the doubleheader coming up on Saturday. They're trying to get every out Absolutely. they can. And, and if he can get through this fifth inning, he might be asked to get the sixth inning as well. Well, pitch count is 
there that yeah. he could do that if he could get a quick out here. Right call and it's three and two. Twins will be able to add a 26th man for the doubleheader on Saturday, but it's expected to be a starting pitcher. See this last pitch, a fastball up and away. This part of the ball apparently caught the strike zone. Full count, Maurer will back away from Betts. A lot of funny things have happened this inning. The infield shifts around now with the count. Gibson struck him out, but the Red Sox take advantage of the leadoff walk and to get a big two out hit as well to score three. You're watching Twins Baseball presented by State Farm. This summer, some of the biggest names in basketball hit the court for a 10 city professional three on three battle. Ice Cube presents Big Three Basketball from Charlotte Monday at 7 Central, only on FS1. What was your wintertime sport? You must have had a wintertime sport in high school, didn't you? Well, in junior high, it was ski jumping, and then uh, it was basketball in high school. No? Yeah, were you any good? I held my own. I can't say I made the NBA, so the answer probably okay. is no. Well, but, but good I was at good, the high school level. Good enough for yeah. a high school player. Okay. Lauer at the knees taking strike one, then Sano and Escobar. I went back to my old high school during the winter to watch a basketball game, and they make a, a big deal in the gym there about the boys and girls who reached the 1,000 point club, and absolutely nothing for those of us who finished 834 <laughs> points short. Not a thing. 0 oh 2 to Mauer. There ought to be some recognition for those of us who didn't quite make the 1,000 point club. Well, you just acknowledge to all the people in Minnesota that you know, we're a little short. And <laughs> I'm sure you'll get a lot of sympathy cards. 0 oh, and 2 to Mauer. Twins hoping to get back uh, a run at least here in the sixth against David Price. 91st pitch of the night for Price. Well, he's working with the lead now. And Mauer slashes a base hit to left. And that ball is backhanded by Benintendi. Nice play there, holding Maurer to a single. He's got a run batted in on a ground ball and two hits. And now let's check in with Kevin Gord. Yeah, we've talked about it tonight, guys. Miguel Sano announced that uh, he will be going to the home run derby at the All Star game. He was all smiles in the club. I was talking about how hard he's worked to get here. What a thrill it will be to be on that type of stage. And Paul Maurer referenced the fact that. He likes the big stage. He thinks Sano is going to really relish that opportunity. Tyler Duffy said, I've been watching this guy for five years, all the way up through the minors, and now with the Twins, this guy's tailor-made to hit the bombs that those fans are looking to see in a contest like that. It should be a lot of fun to watch. 
And here is Sano. All right, Gorgie, I'm going to predict right now. Mike picked a click for the home run derby. Hometown guy, Giancarlo Stanton. Was he a two time defending champion, I believe? Well, I mean, my goodness, think about the adrenaline flowing for him. One strike. And a ball. Aaron Judge to this point yeah. has said that he doesn't want to participate. And really? I'm sure that there will be an immense amount of pressure from people who matter and people who don't matter to try to convince Judge to participate. One and one to Sano. Swing and a miss. Well, I give him credit for uh, taking a stand. If he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to. And you know, there's no law saying he has to. It's an exhibition. A lot of the game itself is an <laughs> exhibition, and the home run derby is something less than that. Yeah. One and two to Sano. Three swings and misses, one away. Second time the Price time. has struck out Sano. Well, the Twins trying to get back into this ball game, leadoff hit. Every time they've had a leadoff hit, the Twins have found a way to cross home plate with that hitter. But David Price. Breaking ball, breaking ball, fastball up and away, and then another breaking ball. And that's David's fourth strikeout. Escobar with two flyouts to right field. Down and away, ball one. I mentioned it before, Escobar has been the most consistent hitter for the Twins in the month of June. That's why he's been on the lineup on a regular basis. Let's see if he can give the Twins a big lift here in the sixth inning. Popped up. It's near the Boston dugout. And caught by Morgan. Two down. And that'll bring up Polanco. Friday, July 7th, it's University of North Dakota night at Target Field. A limited number of UND theme night ticket packages are available that include a game ticket and a green and white Twins cap. You can learn more at twinsbaseball.com slash UND. Here's Polanco nearly hit a three-run home run with two outs in the fourth. Instead, it was a two-run double. And now he'll face Price. In the sixth, he got a change up and belted it almost over the fence and left. Strike one. one. Fastball. It's out hitting the Red Sox six to five, but they bunched some uh, opportune plate appearances together to score three runs in the fifth to take their first lead. And now 0 and 2. David Price has started six games tonight, would be his seventh game for the Sox, and he's left the game four times with a lead. He's only got a pair of wins so far, but he's a guy that understands management during the game. Now he's working with the lead. 100th pitch of the night. Call third strike Polanco back away and the pitch is called on the inside corner the twins are done in the six.
Now to take a look at the road ahead brought to you by Jeep and road has been the operative word in the month of June. And the uh, twins are finishing their second long three city. In this case 11 game road trip with three days four games in Kansas City then the twins are home for a week before the all star break. Down and away ball one to Xander Bogarts leading off the sixth. Jack I think. You know, looking at the schedule I think a lot of people thought. If the twins were in it by Memorial Day boy the, the two road trips in June would be wilting for them they can be for anybody when you Mauer with the fielding play and Gibson right where he needs to yep. be that's how that's supposed to work. Now, Kyle Gibson reacting just the way you're taught. You do this all almost every day in spring training. And as soon as contact is made you see Kyle. Just absolutely sprinting towards the bag Joe Mauer nice. Nice uh, pick and a nice speed. And that's how you're supposed to execute that 3 1 play. One down, Moreland will bat. Twins had the 10 game road trip through the uh, Southern California and Seattle and San Francisco. They went 6 and 4. Mm -hmm. That was a big, big deal for this team to be able to play that long on the road and continue to play well. Here's a ball line to left. Catch and it. Grossman. Goes down to a knee to make the catch and a couple of quick outs here in the sixth. Two down, that'll bring up Ramirez. This is just what Kyle Gibson needed. A couple pitch, a couple outs. Maybe he can get through this inning. The twins can come back and give him a lead. He still has a chance to win the game. He's only given up five hits over five innings. The trouble is he is on the mound trailing by a run to Boston. Ramirez will bat Drew the leadoff walk in the fifth. Right now on this road trip the twins are four and two. And they've got uh, tonight's game obviously and then four in Kansas City if they can. They're in pretty good shape to do that. If they can come back from this road trip. With another winning record. Uh, that's impressive. For this team that. Obviously didn't well, play well on the road last year to have back to back long winning or long. Successful road trips. It definitely is going to make it interesting to see what happens. Post all star break and, and how the team approaches where right. they're at right now. After Kansas City, the Twins have 13 of the next 16 at home with the all star break in the middle. 2 0 oh to Ramirez. Gibson having a hard time throwing strikes to the Boston designated hitter. Uh, Nice to see him come back and get an out here. Ramirez, the only walk of the game to Kyle. And that was his last plate appearance, so that was a leadoff walk in which the trouble started for Kyle. 3 and 0 oh to Ramirez, who will be green lighted if Gibson grooves one. And he grooved one. Five to three, Boston. You know, it's kind of a catch 22 scenario. And that's one of the reasons Kyle hesitates sometimes to throw pitches over, is because he gets results like that. When he does, the ball's hammered. You know, that ball's on the outer half of the plate, belt high. But it's a count where a hitter is looking to extend. And Paul Mahler are going to come out. That'll be the end of the day, I'm sure, for Kyle. It was a 3 1 pitch for Bradley's damaging double in the fifth, and a 3 0 pitch for Ramirez's blast to center. It's 5 to 3. And the Twins won't be able to get six innings from Gibson. First two outs came so quickly, but then he fell behind, and the Red Sox enjoy a two run lead.
Buddy Bo Shears comes out in relief of Kyle Gibson. Now it's so close but so far away for Kyle here tonight. Really an easy first trip through the batting order and then second time didn't go very well and for that matter neither did the third. Bo Shears has been good. He's been part of a good bullpen and his role has actually expanded in recent weeks. And with Craig Breslow on the disabled list with a tender rib cage area. Stands to reason we'll see more and more of Buddy Bo Shears here before the All Star break. One and zero oh to Jackie Bradley Jr. Well, the bullpen at minimum is going to be asked to get three and third outs. Two and zero. Oh. Bradley's hit the ball hard twice tonight. Lining out to Maurer in the second, then on a 3 1 pitch, he had a drive that got hung up in the ladder attached to the Green Monster in left. 3 0 with Vasquez on deck. Well, some funny things happened that inning. They talked about the play in the ladder. There was an error by uh, shortstop Jorge Polanco, and then a ball that it was a bunt situation but was hit hard at Kyle and couldn't turn the double play because nobody was covering second. The only thing in retrospect and I you know it's easy for me to say up here looked like he had a play at third base and plenty of time well, you're to get the force Dick, play. You're taught to get go to two. You're, you're not right. you're not taught to get the lead runner there. You're hoping for the, the good old fashioned right. Double play up, up in the middle half. Bradley's at three line drives here tonight. Shears falling behind, giving up a two out single, and now Vasquez. Vasquez bounced to short, and then he hit another hard ground ball. Polanco might have been screened a little bit by the runner at second, Jackie Bradley Jr. He was charged with an error, and uh, that uh, run came in to score. Two of the three runs that the Red Sox got in the fifth were unearned runs. Dug out by Jimenez. No activity in the Boston pen. Price called uh, got Polanco on strikes a call third strike with his 100th pitch. Unless they've got somebody warmed up ready to go, doesn't look like uh, we've seen the last of David Price yet. No, the 100 pitch mark really doesn't apply to David. One and one. Ball was thrown by him at 91 miles an hour. It looked like Vasquez was a little tardy on a fastball. It's been two consecutive long innings, though, for the Twins defenders. A lot of standing around. This game's really slowed down, and sometimes that has its effect. Momentum. Right field that'll hang in the air for Kepler. Hitting end with the Red Sox get a two out home run from Hanley Ramirez. It's 5 3. Well, a tough ending for Kyle Gibson. You see that Bradley hits this ball into the ladder, one of the funky plays that happened. Hanley Ramirez, 3 0 count, hits a fastball into center field. So a tough way for Kyle to exit this game.
Jackie Casino story of the game and the Twins got the first three runs. Jorge Polanco with a drive almost clearing the wall and left. It was a two run double and then the Red Sox started coming back. First with a Mookie Betts home run leading off the fourth. And then scoring three runs and some quirky plays in the fifth inning and adding another one on the Ramirez home run in the sixth. David Price out there to start the seventh inning. He'll face Max Kepler and maybe Kepler only. Pitching now with a two run lead. Kepler out in front, strike one. Right hander Joe Kelly warming up down in the Red Sox bullpen. You see Neil Allen talking there with Buddy Boschers. Here's Joe Kelly. Swing and a miss. And as long as Kepler's batting average against lefties stays in the 100s, you'll see an awful lot of this. Price, of course, a very durable pitcher, but his high watermark in terms of pitches thrown this year, 107. And the dirt, one and two. Well, I think his manager, John Farrell, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of uh, time together, but he understands the history of David Price. He's thrown a tremendous amount of innings, led the league, I think, in innings 230 last year. So. You know he's going to try to manage him a little bit tenderly, especially, strikes out. especially after having a little arm soreness in spring training. And with Kepler quickly retired, Price will pitch to Jimenez. Box tracks presented by Carrier. Well, a sixth strikeout recorded for David here. Change up at 85. It's right around his average, 104. Jimenez with two ground balls to third. This to right center field, toward the gap, and Bradley jogs after it makes a catch two down. Quick out right there, so he might get yeah. a chance to finish the inning. And it's probably not insignificant. That Price is pitching to the bottom third of the Twins lineup. Kepler, Jimenez, and now Buxton. Buxton 0 for 2, ground ball to short, and a fly ball to center. Actually hit the ball to pretty deep center field out in the triangle area. And Bradley was able to track it down. Well, like the Twins, the Red Sox have a tremendous closer. Craig Kimball is their closer, and you know they can bridge the gap here with another out. David Price. Helps his uh, manager John Farrell and pitching coach Carl Willis. They only have to have maybe two relievers come in, so it makes a big difference with the starter being able to get that extra inning. Kimball got the save the other day, his first career save against the Twins. Buxton takes a strike. And he's now saved the ball game against all 30 teams in baseball. One and one. Now one and two. That foul went to that side of the field. I think that's in its own way a little bit of an encouraging sign that staying on the pitch, staying on the pitch a little bit longer. At least he did on that one. One and two. Two and two. Trying to get a board for Dozier. Twins need uh, to get something done here in the late innings after leading early three to nothing. Well, this game's not out of reach. We're only talking a couple runs. Base runner and a blast, and that can happen quickly here at Fenway. Look out, Gorgie. Gorgie, you all right over there? That was right at him. 
Yeah. I mean that was. I think he got him myself. Now we're going to have to the, confirm it. Uh, the nickname for something like that, I understand, is an ugly finder. Uh, well, in certain cases. Now we're we're okay. Another computer though bites the dust down here. That's twice oh, really? in this series. We've it's, talked about this area. I mean, it, there's just no time to get out of the way, and those computers don't move too fast. <laughs> Unlike former <laughs> goaltenders. Once you got it, you got it. Buxton strikes out, and Price completes seven innings, and maybe has pitched his last here tonight. He comes off the mound with a 5-3 lead. Now for the unlimited baseball break brought to you by T-Mobile. Corey Kluber really sharp again today shutting down the Rangers pretty much five to one Cleveland won the ball game if the score of this game doesn't uh, turn back in uh, the twins away it'll be a game and a half lead for Cleveland. Carlos Correa with four career multi home run games in his young career. What do we make of the Brewers. They're going to win again tonight. And they're going to stay a game ahead of the Cubs who won this afternoon. Brewers are in the National League Central as great a story as the Twins are in the American League Central. I think it has something to do with Fox Sports North. <laughs> it could be. The right and deep. Kepler going back and leaping and making. No, he did not make the catch. Lynn round second on his way to third. Kepler went back. And got to the warning track and had the ball bounce off his glove. There's so much room in right field. And you know it's a short fence which is kind of scary in itself because you're going to jump and maybe go into the seats with the fans. But the ball never gets into his glove and Lynn runs fairly well gets around and rambles around to third base for a leadoff triple. No, maybe he never even touched the ball. No, he no. did not get there. One of the great catches in the 1975 World Series was made by Dwight Evans in just about the exact same spot. So it's a leadoff triple for Lynn. And the Twins have to bring the infield in for Marrero. Same spot pretty much that Marrero was in in the fifth inning. And he had a number in front of Escobar and got the run batted in. Pick off to third. And Lynn gets back. Red Sox got one in the fourth, three in the fifth, one more in the sixth, and a 
threat to do more damage here in the seventh. Yeah, it's a, such an important run there at third base for both teams. Twins can't afford to have them score again. They're running out of time, only two more chances for the Twins. And they're going to see Craig Kimbrell in the ninth. Two and zero to Marrero. Strike. Good change up there from Buddy. Getting the outside edge. An extra base hit. And Boshears has faced four men and given up three hits. Well, that one left over the heart of the plate. A little breaking ball, but left up. Great concentration there. That was a great camera shot of Marrero keeping his head on the ball. The number nine hitter has driven in two runs. Still nobody out of the seventh, and now Mookie bats. Driven foul by about a foot right at the feet of Will Little, the first base umpire. Strike. I want to go back to something you expressed before the Red Sox had scored a run, and you know, the Twins ended up having a long top of the fourth inning. But you said at the time that Gibson wanted to get back out there, and that's really when the game changed. Coincidentally or not, he went out there, gave up the leadoff home run to Betts. You know, the Twins were hitting for a long time, scored a couple of runs, and you'd say, well. Said all he wants as long as the Twins keep scoring. But again, coincidentally or not, Gibson was sailing along for three innings, and the Red Sox have uh, teed off on him and Boshears ever since. Well, yeah, unfortunately, it's been a little bit of a pattern with Kyle. He'll have that one inning where his laps, I don't know what it is, but you know, he's cruising along, hadn't given up a walk, and then in the fifth inning, he gives up a leadoff walk, and the tent caves in. You know, I don't. I don't know why it happened so much. But it's something about focus that he's got to work on. I mean, those are the things he's got to recognize and you know, maybe avoid the leadoff walk. I mean, that's the best plan ever, right. but I'm not, I'd be lying to everybody if I was telling you I never did that. I did it a lot. But it's about damage control and what you do after you get in trouble. That's what matters the most. Gave up the home run to bets, but then got the next three batters in the yep. fourth and then everything kind of unraveled in the fifth. One and two. Bats to short right field. And Kepler got a late break, but he gets there for the catch one away. So one down, and now Ben and This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Minnesota Twins and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent of the Minnesota Twins. Benintendi with a single in the first. He was doubled up later in the inning. And since then, a pop up to Dozier and a strikeout. Phil Hughes warming up in the Twins' pen. This would be a good time to get Phil into a game. I asked Paul Molitor yesterday after Phil was reactivated. I said, you know, what about warming him up? Because of course, for several years, Phil's been a starter. He was uh, he had great success as a reliever for the Yankees years ago. And he said, well, he would prefer to have Phil start an, an inning. inning yeah. And so, with that in mind, and and he still he was, may. And the next inning. 
Yeah. Right. Right. I, I, I think this is a case where they're hoping that Bo Shears can get through this seventh inning and then have Hughes pitch the eighth. One and zero to Benintendi. And that's fouled away. Bill had a couple of appearances at Rochester out of the bullpen. Added to the active roster up here with Frank Breslow going on the disabled list. Second pitch foul back. Red Sox took two out of three from the Twins at Target Field. They're threatening to go three out of four here at Fenway Park. Scored in four straight innings after Gibson had faced the minimum number of batters through three. Pick off throw to second. Jimenez tried to pick off earlier with Lynn at third. You didn't mind catchers doing that, did you? Well, as long as they make accurate throws. I mean, I'm not sure that was, there was a need to throw on that situation because Marrero was not very off, far off the bag. Two and two. Check this way. Now three and two. And for Boshier's part, he needs to throw strikes. He's thrown 23 pitches, 13 strikes. Shears facing six batters, retiring just two. First and second, one down, and Phil Hughes will make his first relief appearance for the Twins. Out of necessity, Hughes comes in trying to keep the Twins within striking distance in the seventh. As he gives up three hits on a walk to six batters, and he gives the uh, Red Sox another scoring threat here, handing the game over to Phil Hughes, first and second, one down. Yeah, it feels a little weird to see 
Bill Hughes come out of the bullpen. But that's where he's at right now. And he's going to come into a situation where he inherits a couple base runners and one out. Last pitching regularly out of the bullpen in 2009. He did make seven starts, but most of his appearances that year for the Yankees were as a reliever. He was really, really good. Guys uh, on the team that year, coaches will tell you that Phil Hughes was quite an asset as a late inning reliever. Of course, not closing games with Mariano Rivera on the team, but bridging uh, the game to, Riv uh, to Rivera. Had a 3.03 ERA, an opponent batting average of 217. Facing Bogarts, first and second, one down. And at 92 miles per hour, Phil Hughes delivers strike one. That's about where Phil topped out at in Rochester, and he was hoping that now that he, for the time being, anyways, just a one inning or so pitcher at a time, that he might see what so many do a spike in velocity and that still may happen but it's going to take a little time. One strike. Fouled away at one 92 thing, again. One thing Phil has always been able to do is throw strikes. He's a guy that at times probably threw too many strikes but. Apparently he's got a slider now along with his cutter. And head in the count. No balls, two strikes. Off the plate again at 92. Phil said yesterday he thought that getting into a big league game and would you know, give a little adrenaline kick, and that might uh, show up in a uptick in velocity. From what he had at Triple A. One and two. Well, I can tell you one thing that wasn't that Triple A. 36,000 people <laughs> watching it. So that does in itself give you a little of adrenaline. Another great car crowd here in downtown Boston. Another sellout for the Red Sox. Because of their three world championships, they may sell out for the rest of your and my lifetime. Fouled away. Four fastballs and all four clocked at 92. When Phil was going good a couple of years ago as a starter, he was able to start his cutter. Almost at the hitter, and it would just catch the inside corner. We're talking right handed hitters here. And that would be a great pitch to throw Bogarts in this situation. Gets him on a strikeout away. Really good spot. Down and away, gets a strikeout, two down, and that'll bring up Moreland. Look at all the pitches that Phil threw. Away, 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 and away. Away and away. It's like he's pitched in this ballpark before. So I think he's pitching away. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Moreland. 0 for 3 in the ball game. Come back to the mound. Grounder to the right side, actually fielded by the shortstop for an out in the fourth. Then he lined out to Grossman, who made a nice running catch in the sixth. Missing again at 92. Probably at a point in his career, and his fans should probably get to that point too. Here's a ball lifted to short left. Grossman near the line makes a catch at it. Back pedal at the end. Hughes gets the Twins off the field in the seventh, but the Red Sox add one more.
run lead midway into the ball game, and then all the Twins find themselves down by three. Brian Dozier will lead off the eighth against Joe Kelly. He's been really, really good in this role for the Red Sox. A whip, walk, and hits per inning pitch of just over one. Well, another guy that's a flamethrower, right handed pitcher, Joe Kelly. He's got a very live fastball, throws a lot of them. It'll be Dozier, Grossman, and Maurer. Down low, ball one. So he starts out Brian with a breaking ball. Upstairs, a swing and a miss. Well, it's amazing. We talked about it in the last couple games. The bullpen for the Boston Red Sox have got some real power arms now. Kimbrell, the closer, can touch triple digits. This guy has done that before. Joe Kelly, Matt Barnes can throw it hard. Just came from Cleveland. They've got some pretty hard throwers there, too. We'll go to Kansas City. We've got some guys who can throw it pretty hard too. One and two to do. One of the reasons, in my opinion, why Boston is uh, currently in first place in their division is because of their bullpen. They've really done a nice job of assembling guys out there that have done their job. And Dozier got a piece of it. Vasquez couldn't hang on to the tip. 101. At least that's what the ticker says. Craig Kimball out there, kind of tying his shoes, getting ready to uh, maybe warm up for the night. One and two. Batters box and a new baseball for Kelly two and two. Trying to pick nits and offer some hope. Kelly's walks are up a little bit. 15 of them in 32 and two thirds. Two and two to Dozier. Another fastball at 101 upstairs, and Dozier was able to get a piece of it. To me, that's in itself crazy <laughs> that anybody can even make contact with a pitch that's thrown that hard. Up there. Yeah. It's hard to get your hands or keep your hands on top of the ball when it's thrown that hard up, up high. But it shows the bat speed and the quickness of Brian Dozier. Up the middle. Bogarts with a nice pick and throws him out. What a play by Xander Bogarts. Dozier sent it almost directly over the second base bag, and Do uh, Bogarts was able to pick it off and turn it into an out. I'm not really sure he knew he had this ball initially, but once he felt in his glove, what a spin and accurate throw over to Mitch Moreland. Very nice play. That's big league baseball right there. One down, and the Twins are running out of outs. Here's Robbie Grossman. Oh. The outside corner. One strike. Grossman with a fly ball that advanced Dozier from second to third in the first inning. Dozier later came in on a ground ball off the bat of Maurer for the game's first run. Then he cracked a double and scored in the fourth. Right off the end of the bat. Spinner foul and it's only two. Dozier's double came as a right-handed batter and it went right down the left field line. In fact, 
quarterback that bounced up into the seats for a ground rule though. I don't know if we've seen anything faster than that since <laughs> Araldus Chapman threw 103, I think, but that's getting up there, folks. Kelly's all of 6'1, 185 pounds. 100, not close. That's one and two. So the answer to the obvious question is where does all the power come? Because they're not physically imposing guys and Bert usually says it's the legs. I would agree, but it's his explosion. His arm arm spot when he's getting ready to load, and then his explosion towards the catcher's glove. And that comes from the legs. Foul back, it'll reach the seats. You know, ironically, and I don't know if Bert's ever talked about this, and I haven't talked about it too much, but it's not about arm speed, it's about deceleration. The the real Stress on a guy's arm is not throwing the baseball, it's stopping your arm. And that's where you can get hurt. It's the backside, your lat muscles, and the backside of your shoulders that have to decelerate that arm when it's thrown that fast. Almost like a shock absorber, I suppose. Huh? One and two. Postman's at bat still alive. I don't know if uh, you're aware of it, Noah Syndergaard. Guy that throws 100 mile an hour fastballs for the New York Mets. That's the issue that he has right now is his lat. One and two. Grossman hanging tough. He fought off 90 miles per hour after looking at 102. When you get geared up for 102, and you can fight off 85 without blowing an oblique. That's pretty good. 83. A lot of pitches. Grossman doing a nice job hanging in there in this at bat. Work and it's just two and two. <laughs> Eight pitches. That was, I would consider this high stress, even though they've got a three run lead. Joe Kelly's already recorded an out. When you're throwing that hard and you throw that many pitches to one guy, it's high stress. This is quite a battle here. Five two strike fouls for Grossman. You see Kelly. Dozier's at bat. I mean, Dozier fought off some two strike pitches and then hit a hot ground ball up the middle. Thing is, at 102 miles an hour, do you really have command? Or is it just here it is? I don't know where it's going. I'm hoping it's in the zone, but I don't think you can catch up to it. I think that's what it is. And if he could locate 102, which is almost impossible, I think that's what we've seen, though. 100 and above pitches have been high yep. and wide and it's natural. I mean that's that's what I'm trying to explain is you just don't have command of your pitches when you throw that hard. It's got a little bit of movement but it's just pumping it up and letting it fly. Full count now to Grossman. And another foul ball. Almost every one of these pitches have been tailing up and away. All his fastballs. And I know the catcher at times has sat on the inside corner, which would be lights out if he could hit his glove. Six two strike fouls. Grossman in this at bat has fouled off 100, 90, and 85. Fastball in. That's what he wants. Let's see where Joe Kelly throws it. And 
a two hopper to second. Lynn has it along with Pat. A nice battle by Grossman ends up being out number two. Well, Kelly won the war. And he battled there for about 10 pitches, I think. 12 pitches. We'll bring Maurer with the bases empty. Maurer's average back up to 291. He's had a good series here. He typically does here. And uh, I don't have to use too much imagination. As Imagine Joe's batting average at the All Star break starting with a three. That wouldn't be nice. Aaron Judge leading the league at 333 starting play today. Ball one. So, no, of course, had his batting average over 300 for a while, two and a half weeks ago, but. Been in a steady decline ever since. Has there ever been a rookie come up and win the Triple Crown? Well, I don't believe so. I was uh, on a radio show yesterday talking about. I don't believe there's been a Rookie of the Year winner who was also the MVP since Fred Lynn did it in '75. I meant to check on that, but I failed to do so. That was a pretty good rookie class for the Red Sox, wasn't it? They had Fred Lynn and Jim Rice in the same year. 99, but up, and it's 2 and 1. Judge right now is leading the league, tied for the league lead in batting average with Corey Dickerson of Tampa Bay. Three home runs ahead of George Springer, but Springer got one today. And three runs batted in ahead of Nelson Cruz, so he's leading or has a share of the lead of the Triple Crown category. Two and two to Maurer. Well, Joe Kelly, I would describe as a slow worker. <laughs> he is taking time in between pitches. Trying to conserve his energy to get that gas, I guess. Throw it. Another full count. I think we can see why walks are a little too high, but when you have strikeout ability, as Kelly does, Woods have had a couple of long at bats. Kelly, he's thrown 24 pitches. Yeah, and if you put in two and a half minutes between pitches, <laughs> fouled away by Mauer. <laughs> he's working out of the stretch, which a lot of relievers do, but there's no base runners. And he's still taking his time. It's not like he's holding the guy on or trying to. Upset his timing over. There. Seven pitches to Brian Dozier. A dozen to Robbie Grossman. This will be number seven for Maurer. Kelly three ground ball out you're watching Twins baseball presented by State Farm.
And Hanley Ramirez will lead off the bottom of the eighth. He's just taken a fastball for strike one from Phil Hughes. And now up and in one and one. Well, Hanley worked the count his last plate appearance against Kyle Gibson. Green lighted on three and oh. Three and oh and got a pitch up and away. And Kyle probably wants that one back. You know, and I, we're again guilty of it as much as anybody else. We talk about somebody with better control. Gibson walked four in his last start, just one here, but he found himself in a really bad count to Jackie Bradley Jr., three and one, and then that 3 0 count. And sometimes uh, good control is reflected in a lot more than just the number of walks. Well, you don't want to be in 3 0 counts, number one. Right. But it's the fact that Kyle pitches away so much that I think hitters start recognizing that. You know, we live in a day and age where you got video and you've got, you can go back almost every at bat of your career and watch and see what you've done against guys. And family hasn't played in a couple of games, but he knows that Kyle Gibson is going to stay middle half away. And when he fell behind, he's, he's just going to dive out there. One down in the eighth. Bradley will hit. Meanwhile, so, Phil Hughes looking pretty sharp here in his return. Haven't given up uh, any well hit balls at all. Three outs on 12 pitches. Bradley's hit the ball hard three times tonight. And a foul. By the way, uh, Leo, our stats guy here, and my friends on Twitter, and I do consider most of them. Friends, anyway, they have told me Ishiro also won the Rookie of the Year and the MVP in 2001. Triple crown. That's what I'm looking. Yeah, for. no, I don't think I don't, don't believe that's ever happened. Leo said no. It's a base hit. Bradley's had a really good night at the plate, and that's been the norm for the Red Sox. He had a very slow first month and a half, and he's been one of their better hitters over the last month and a half. A one out single and now Christian Vasquez. Well as we wind down this series here in Fenway against Boston. You know we talk a lot about the young players for the twins. Buxton and Kepler and Sano and Rosario. Polanco. But uh, here in Boston they've got a few that have really come to the top and that's Bogarts Bradley Jr. So baseball is really changing of the guard and the new generation of players that can play the game. Well, in the case of the Boston Stars, Bradley, and to a lesser extent, Betts. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't it, overnight. No, it wasn't. I mean, they both struggled a little bit too. One and zero the count. Hughes to Vasquez. But you know, and you referenced Chuck Knobloch last year, the rookie of the year in 1991. Knobloch benefited immensely from coming to a veteran team where there was no pressure to immediately produce. My goodness, you had Herbeck, Puckett, Shilly Davis, you had Pagliarulo, Gagne. I mean, just you know, he was the only young guy yeah. on that team. Scotty Leyes to some degree, but. You know, there's Chile, the hitting coach for the for the uh, Red Sox. Well, and they kept him in line. He was a young kid with an attitude, and uh, he needed some schooling, and they schooled him. And I think that's why he was so good at a young age. And then later on, he became the guy, and I think that changed the way he yeah. went about his business. Swing and a miss. But similarly, they've had some young guys here, and you had the presence of David Ortiz. And Dustin Pedroia and guys like that. It's a lot easier, I suppose, for young, unproven players to eventually prove themselves when the pressure is off. If you're a, if you're a ball player, and I'll say this in any city, and you come in as a young kid and you're truly a ball player, you're going to pay attention to the guys who have had success. And in this case, Pedroia here, Ortiz, they're going to listen to them. They're going to watch them. How do they go about their business? What made them so good? One and two to Vasquez. It's 
Francis Lynn. No, he's on deck. Sure, yeah, yeah. The Lynn's monitor is messing me up. And Hughes now with the velocity down to 90. And one foul ball after the other. This game again moving along at the speed of stink. <laughs> I didn't know that was a time measurement. Well, you could imagine. Depends on the wind, I guess. Another one, two to Vasquez. And now two and two. Are counting on Hughes to do what he's done in terms of strike throwing ability. But again, when he was a, an effective reliever with the Yankees years ago, he had more velocity sure. than he has now. And that may come back. You know, Phil's still dealing with that uh, tingling. That's why he was on the DL in the first place this year after having that classic syndrome. Grossman stays with it, makes the catch Surgery. two down. Thoracic outlet syndrome. Two down. And that'll bring up Lynn. Lynn with a single in the third. A leadoff triple in the seventh and a run score. Check of the runner Bradley at first. It's like slow motion here tonight for some reason. The yep. defense have really been standing around a long time. Both and sides. now one and one. David Price, not the fastest worker, Joe Kelly. In relief, took forever to throw 28 pitches and record three straight outs. Twins trying this with Phil Hughes out of the bullpen, an experiment for someone you were counting on to be uh, in the starting rotation. One and one, and a foul away. Phil's under contract to the Twins for two more years after this year, so it's in his interest and the Twins' best interest. To find some role that he can succeed in. And if physically he's unable to be an effective starter, and Twins can count on him as they did in his first year with the Twins to go six innings, well, this is the next option. One and two. Breaking ball, the check swing, strike three, and that ends the inning. Phil Hughes' debut as a reliever goes an inning in two thirds. He gives up just one hit. We'll see if the Twins can force a bottom of the ninth.
Miguel Sano will lead off the ninth inning for the Twins, and you're running out of time if you haven't already maxed out your votes for Miguel Sano. We encourage you to. It's kind of come down to the wire here between he and Jose Ramirez, and you have an hour, 36 minutes, and 10 seconds, 9 seconds, 8 <laughs> seconds to vote for Miguel Sano. It'd be great to see Sano represent the Twins as the starting third baseman for the American League. Kimbrell into the ball game to try to pin down a three run save. Down and away ball one. Kimbrell the other night here got his first save ever against the Twins and he's now made it 30 for 30. He's saved at least one game against everybody. 32 saves for the year. This guy is legit. Up and in. At 99. Brandon Kinchler with 21 saves, tied with Kimbrel for the American League lead. And then yeah, I got to believe Brandon's got to be strongly considered. I would for hope so. An All-Star chance this year. Santana among the league leaders. I, whether it should be or not, I think his start tomorrow against Jason Vargas is could very well determine who gets the start for the American League. Yeah. Vargas is leading the league in earned run average. Two and one to Sano. And at the knees again at 99. Miguel Sano almost certainly will go to the All-Star game. It's just a question of whether. He has voted as the starting third baseman. Two and two. And so no strikes out for the third straight time. It'll be tomorrow. And we hesitate at times to over promote a, what should be a pitcher's duel, but. Santana has been the ace of the Twins and Jason Vargas has been the ace for the Royals. Twins have won seven of the eight meetings between the two teams and it's a four game series with a doubleheader on Saturday and getting started tomorrow. Vargas has done a really nice job over the years against the Twins. He's a guy that give him some kind of fits because he changes speed so well. Right. And Irvin does the same thing and it'll be a good pitching matchup tomorrow night. Escobar takes a seat. He had to lift his feet up to avoid being hit by the pitch. Ball one. Twins. Twins are looking at it to see whether that ball might have hit Escobar. Uh, the Twins go to Kansas City, provided now we got. A, I've been reading about a travel ban. We can still go to Kansas City, can't we? From here? Yes. Okay. And the Red Sox are going to Toronto. And there's an up and in 2 0. Oh. The Indians are going to Detroit to open up a weekend series against the Tigers. Two and oh, but it was two and oh to Sano and Kimbrel came back to strike him out. This is another guy that's had arm problems over the years, <clears throat> but has really responded well and pitched outstanding so far for the Red Sox. Ninety-eight, you know, another swing and a miss. His ninety-eight seems faster than Joe Kelly's one hundred, and it's because of the how fluidly it comes out of his arm.
nothing tricky here. 100 miles an hour right down the middle of the plate. Part of the glove, part of the mask. Another 2-2 two -two to Escobar. Kelly's heat and put the ball in play on the ground three times. Just need a little uh, offense here against Kimbrell. He saw his numbers. He doesn't give up much. He's only missed one save opportunity. All back. Up, it'll reach the seats. A long rain delay in Chicago. They're uh, trying to uh, schedule the first pitch in about a half an hour. And I'm assuming those teams have to take off uh, for other destinations too. Red Sox stay at home. The Yankees go to Houston. Eight pitches in this at bat so far for Escobar. I wonder where he learned that uh, position to read his signs. And another foul. I mean, what possesses a yeah, guy? I to don't know. Look into the catcher's glove and read the signs like a scarecrow. You remember? Uh, you remember Rod Beck? He did the the Met kind of with his pitching hand closer for the Giants. He would swing his pitching arm back and forth like a like a metrodome, and I, and I often wonder now where did he come up with that? Yeah. Escobar battling tough and nothing's come easy for these Red Sox relievers who all throw about 100 miles per hour. And Escobar fouls another one off. Quite a battle going on here again. Twins had some battles against uh, Joe Kelly. In the top of the eighth inning, here in the top of the ninth, it's not easy. Kimbrell's going to have to work. 15 pitches thrown already. And another foul. What a battle by Escobar. He's 0 for 3 in the ball game. Put the ball in the air three times, twice to right field, and once near the Boston dugout. Moreland made a catch. Kelly and now Kimbrell throw a lot more pitches than they would prefer for the game tomorrow at the Rogers Center. On the ground, what an at bat for Escobar. He'll get an infield hit. Great job by Eduardo Escobar finally putting it in play, and he's aboard with one out. We talked about Joe Kelly winning the battle, and this one. Eduardo Escobar gets the best of Craig Kimbrell inside out swing. A little spinner right down the middle of the plate. Polanco with a two run double in the fourth. That is a right handed batter against David Price. Taking a strike. It's hard to hit. I can't imagine it would be easy to bunt either when it comes at you that fast. Well, that's where it gets kind of scary. You got to make sure your body's <laughs> not over the plate, but your bat is. A high fly to right field and retreating is bets. Short of the track and now on the edge of the track makes the catch for out number two. 
who gave it a ride, but in the ballpark. A long way to right field here. And that'll leave it to Kepler. Kepler gave one a ride last night. A home run over the roof of the Boston bullpen with a 17 degree launch angle. And when I talked to him about it before the game, he said, Yeah, target field, that would have been a double. He absolutely smoked the ball. Here, he's just trying to keep the game alive. Eddie Rosario's in the on deck circle. Should Kepler do just that? Strike one, and Escobar advances on defensive indifference. This was a this was a one iron. Yeah, this is uh, the kind of swing that really excites a lot of people, including me. I mean, that line drives are to me the prettiest thing in baseball because the it, it pretty much emphasizes how this makes any sense, how squarely you hit the ball. Yeah. Strike to Kepler. And now, too, Paul Molitor was commenting on that before the game. He said, you, know, you can see something like that, and you really have to appreciate it because it, a ball hit like that doesn't happen very often. He likened it to Vargas's home run in San Francisco. Quinn's down to their last strike. Again, Kepler trying to hang tough here against Kimbrough. Up high, one and two. So the Twins beat the Red Sox once at Target Field, and as it turned out, just once here at Fenway Park, the season series goes 5 2 Boston. Well, Boston's a first place team for a reason, and that guy right on the mound is part of that reason. Craig Kimbrell records his 33rd save. But David Price wins the game, and uh, he suffered through a couple tough innings early, but then he settled in, ends up going seven innings, and Resting that bullpen. Good outing for David Price.